blow your speakers with heavy metallurgy how's it going everybody welcome to another episode of heavy metallurgy number 85 to be exact alan christmas cheer i see is uh in full effect over on your end of the, the country after entering about 680 individual grades by hand this week the semester is done so oh ho, ho, ho. i'm ready to go for the all holidays. right awesome <laughs> um Oh my God. And praise Jesus. It's all done. There you go. There you go. And, um, is there anything we should probably run through some details before we bring on our guests this evening? Uh, absolutely. Um, the basics of course. Yep. That, not much really new to report. Just, you know, new shirt design. We got two shirt designs links in the description. Um, super chats available like comment. Um, thanks for all the comments on the last video. The, um, mm -hmm. Uh, can metalheads be audio files video it's gonna take me a minute to get through them there's some dissertations there to process for sure <laughs> yeah. but um how was uploading that new video marty that's the first time when you had uh pre-recorded in a while was everything smooth on the new setup oh it's it's glorious it's awesome. everything is good everything is good very happy with the new gear good to hear good to hear but yeah thanks to everybody starting to join in the chat hope everybody's getting into the holiday spirit and yeah ready to hang out for another friday night conversation we've got one returning guest and one new guest who we've been wanting to bring on for a long time and the calendar's finally lined up so we could get it all to work out yeah this uh first guest is a gentleman i long time ago uh we had uh Dwayne lazarus on last week he was one of the inspirations for me getting into this youtube stuff and this guy right here also is a very big part of that. I watched a bunch of his videos and decided that it looked like a lot of fun and it's something I wanted to try it as well. Um, not only that, but he is a very talented graphic designer. He owns a record label called No Life Till Metal. He is a member of the Metal Roundtable, which is another YouTube channel. To Go check them out. Links in the description. And he's done some other stuff too, but let's get him on here. Scott, welcome. How you doing, man? Doing well. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for joining us. Been wanting to have you on. You've been on the list for a while, and just you have yeah. been on the list for a while. I finally just uh, decided. Okay, we, it's time. We had Dwayne on. Now it's time to get Scott on. It's time. Absolutely. Okay. Have you guys um, had Greeno on be before? Never had Greeno. No. Hmm. He was one of those other guys that's been around forever that I that kind of got me into doing this whole thing. Yeah, I think he's just doing the uh, Metal Man Cave of Doom or the Man Cave of Doom or whatever. Yeah, yeah, he's not doing his own channel anymore, which is unfortunate because I loved his channel. He would show some cool stuff, and it's kind of amazing the stuff he would find. I mean, like yourself. I mean, you've 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 got your finger on the pulse of um, just about everything. It's pretty cool. It's I always learn something new, and I'm assuming we're about the same age, so I think we have some similar stories in metal. You like a lot of the same thrash that I do, and then a whole bunch of stuff that I totally didn't know anything about. So there's been a lot of times in your videos I've uh, had a checklist afterwards that I went shopping for. But um, <laughs> so thank you, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I have that same issue. My wife hates when I'm watching these channels because I'm. That's what I. I literally have a pad next to my computer where I write stuff down or when I'm watching people's videos. <laughs> right on. Got to. Yep. Yep. But um, I do want to talk to you about No Life Till Metal. We'll just get going on that right away. I mean, you were a graphic designer. You work for a company. You have broke away. You're doing your own thing. You're doing predominantly, I'm assuming, metal covers and stuff, design. You do work with a lot of bands, and that kind of trickled down, and now you're doing your own record label as well. Can you talk about No Life Till Metal for a bit? And Yeah. I, well, I mean, I, I worked at a printing company as a graphic artist for 27 years. And uh, I got a manager who was uh, trying to think of a nice way to say asshole, but there's no other way to describe it. Um, <laughs> it's universal. You can, we'll run it through the translator. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. He was just, he was making my life miserable when I was a manager there. So my wife and I were like, I need to figure something out. I can't, you know, deal with the stress anymore. And so um, I had been already doing some side work with some of the, some of the record labels that I deal with now. So I'm like, I'm just going to go for it. We're going to quit my job. I'm going to give him plenty of notice, quit my job, and I'm going to, you know, start doing graphics on my own, whether it's music stuff or I don't care. I'll do wedding invitations. Or, you know, anything's better than this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, I literally went down to the city, got my business license. Um, they laughed at me in this, at the city because I, I gave him the name of the company. I said, there's no light to metal. He's like, what does that mean? I said, uh, they said, if you're not part of it, you're not going to know. And then I, they said, well, what is the, the description of the label? I said, oh, it's going to be record reviews record label 
and graphic design. They're like, no, those things don't go together. That's what they actually told me down at the city hall. And I'm <laughs> like, like they know. Uh, I'm like, yes, they do. And I pulled my phone out. And I'm like, here's a bunch of album designs that I do. Here's my website. Oh, okay. So they get, I got my license literally on the drive home. I called one of their labels that I was doing some side work for. And I said, Hey, I'm, you know, I'm quitting my job and I'm going to do this full time. So if you need any work, let me know. That's awesome because of, we just fired our graphic designer and you're in. Nice. So nice. that very first time I, I've done every, everything that they've released since that day, which is five years ago now. Wow. It's been and five years. Wow. And since that time, I picked up um, three other labels that I do all their stuff for. Um, and then I've done some other labels where I've done, you know, they'll call me up. Can you do this? Can you do that? And this is the onesie twosie thing. And, or mm -hmm. maybe they'll give me one or two albums. And, but yeah, that's, that's pretty much how it started. Uh, and the way I got hooked up with the labels is because of the band that I was in. You know, I was on some of those labels. And when we put our albums out, I was always like, can I do my own covers? Can I do my own layouts? And they're like, yeah, go ahead. Because Of course, they didn't care because it saved them some money. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I get mm -hmm. it. Um, but um, that's and that's how it kind of happened. And now I am working a bazillion hours a day trying to keep up with the labels and went from doing just the small labels to now I'm doing stuff with Capital Music and um Metal Blade and Century Media and a lot of those other labels. So, which is really cool. I mean, I'm not doing yeah. it directly for them, but I'm working on, you know, stuff like Nevermore and and mm -hmm. Flotsam and Jetsam and, you know, uh, Accuser. I'm doing, I'm literally working on the entire Accuser catalog right now. So, nice. Cool. Um, yeah. So, well, you yep, jumped at the right I, time. You, you jumped at the right time. Yep. I think so. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, also, and, uh, I, and the one one other thing I was going to say about that is when I quit the company, they didn't want me to quit, so they kept offering me more money. And I'm like, no, it's just not worth it now. No. Yeah. Right after I quit, they fired the jerk that was that was driving me nuts. Mm -hmm. So they couldn't find anybody to take my place, so they called me back and to fill in the extra time or extra money that I wasn't making up front because I only had really the one label to start with. I worked there part time as a. I wasn't a. I wasn't a. I didn't work for them. I was my own company, but I and I build them, so it was that that filled in the gap. Now I now I have so much business. They've called me to help them work out, and I'm just like, sorry, can't do it. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, yeah, it worked out good, uh, and I, and I really enjoy doing what I do, despite the the stress at points. Like, oh yeah, was, and the and the it's kind of hard when you're in your house doing it. It's real easy to pull away from your loved ones. Is like I got to get some more stuff done and work. I mean, I, I get that. I get it. Yeah. And one of the things <laughs> that we did was we built my, my own office outside of my house next to my house. Mm. So I'm, I go in there, I shut the door. I'm in my office. It's, I'm not in the house anymore. So. Right. That helps. Yeah. Yeah. Helps. So it's, it's, it's nice. I, I, I enjoy doing it, but like I said, it can, it can get stressful sometimes. Today was one of those days where I was, had a big lump in my stomach and was fighting the urge to puke, but. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. <laughs> we well, just, we're, we're, we're Go ahead. One of the one of the labels I work for just put out a box set, and I can't give a whole lot of details because it's still in the works. But one, they just put out a box set, and they they got their shipment in, and come to find out the rec, the distribution, the company that prints the thing put the music on two of the discs. They swapped them, <sighs> so it's a six C, six CD set with two, and they and they immediately called me and asked me if I uploaded the artwork wrong. Did you upload the all wrong artwork to the wrong CD? And I'm like, I sure as heck hope not. So I had to spend like two hours going through all my emails and checking. And no, I didn't. It wasn't me. It was them. So it happens. But still, yeah. But still, it was like that. That immediately. That immediate. Oh, we just. That's a thirty thousand dollar job that yep. they just did. And there's a mistake on it. Did I make the mistake? So that yeah, that kind of stuff makes me nuts. Oh, no, yeah. no pressure. <laughs> yeah. I, I've been a screen printer forever, and uh, even in the big shops, I mean, mistakes do happen. I mean, I worked yeah. in a big commercial shop before I did the same thing you did. I broke off. My wife is like, you're not happy there. Print print at home. So I bought all the gear I needed. I, I'm a screen printer here, but, you know, you get someone in the shop on a military job. You're printing army shirts that uh, they didn't get any of the logo straight, and that's like a hundreds of thousands of dollars screw up. <laughs> Yeah, that's no, interesting. I worked it's... at I worked at Visionware Visionwear for a while. Visionware T shirt design company. Yep. Visionware Vision Streetwear, whatever it was. I worked there for like four years. Yep. yep. And now I'm doing kind of what you're doing. I'm printing shirts for bands and labels and the occasional brewery and enough to keep me busy and the lights on and the, the wolves away. And that's that's what 
Yep. We're making we're live making a living through metal. Maybe not the way we thought we would, but we're we're still we're still working at it. <laughs> yeah, definitely no rock star, that's for sure. No. <laughs> um, I also want to talk briefly about the metal round table. You've kind of it's been about a year you've been working with those guys, hasn't it? Maybe a little less. I think it's been a little longer than that now. Oh, really? Because, okay. Yeah, because um they took a break. Um one of the guys took a break for a while and they asked me if I would fill in for him for a while, and I did. Um, I can it had to be over a year ago now because it was before Christmas mm. and um, I filled in for him for about a month or two months and then he came back and then they were like, do you want to just stay? I'm like, sure. So yeah, I've been doing it ever since with them guys, uh, Carcass John and uh, Metal Rob. Yep. And it's typically every Wednesday. Is that when you guys are live? Every Tuesday, every Tuesday we're live at, um, uh, I think it's seven Eastern time. Right. Yeah. It's a, it's a time where I'm like, Sometimes I can catch it. Sometimes I can't, but it's always in anybody that isn't familiar. It's, it's kind of a, an environment like this, you know, uh, talking about topics and um, metal related stuff. It's, it's very cool. Very, very fun show. Definitely go check them out. Link in the description and also kind of leading up to our topic tonight. Um, you've been pretty connected with the whole Christian scene for, for some time. I'm looking at, I'm looking at ultimatum and you guys went from 93 to 2016 that's 23 years. I'm sure we're, was it all solid or was there breakups in the middle there somewhere? There, it was solid. We, um, it was, um, 92 was when the band formed first out first demo came out in 93. So yeah, that's, you got it about right. Um, and we practiced two, three times a week, almost that entire time Wow. and played shows. And we never went on like a, a long tour, um, because it, there was not enough money in it for us to not work. <laughs> yeah. So we were all working, but we would do like, um, we would take vacation or we'd use our vacation time and we'd, we'd go out and we'd play, you know, Col Colorado and then we, New Mexico, and then we'd go to Arizona and then California. And that would be the whole thing. It'd be like four dates, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, we did it, but then we did that for 20 years straight. Um, and other than, you know, having a few members come and go, it was, it was solid. We never stopped. We were always practicing. We were always writing, putting out albums when we could. Um, yeah. I mean, it was fun. I got five full length know. albums and one EP and plus a bunch of other stuff too. I mean, the, the metal archives, uh, list is pretty, there's a lot of stuff. You guys were yeah. somewhat prolific over 23 years. It's cool. Yeah. We put out a demo and a, a several demos and box, a box set and all kinds of fun stuff. So yeah, yeah. it was it, I enjoyed doing it. It was a lot of work, <laughs> especially for me, because I was doing a lot of the graphics and I was doing a lot of the connection and I was the one talking to the record companies. And so I was doing a lot of the work. But um, I, I just honestly, the, the reason that ended is, is, is I got tired of playing bars at one o'clock in the morning to, you know, ten the people. other bands. Yeah. yeah. Um, especially in my own town where we, even in the 90s, we'd play here and we'd play to, you know, we'd pack a bar out. But by the end of the 2000s it was we were it was a handful of people we'd play in arizona and we'd get a crowded you know a full bar um but we played here it was you know you're playing to the other bar and somebody's girlfriends you know it, it was getting tiresome <laughs> it is i mean you start getting family things going on and you're no one i i don't think many people realize the behind the scenes of a band because they see you on the stage and they think it's all fun and games, but it's a lot of BS doing a it. A lot of BS. I mean, the practicing, the buying gear. I mean, you buy Merchan gear, merchandise. merchandising. You got to have people lined up for that and then come help while you're playing. And then, of course, the humping gear. Humping gear is the worst fucking thing ever. It just is. Yes, Drum sets, is. amps, um, pick it up, drive to the venue pull it out, set it up, tear it down, go back to back and forth, back and forth, up and down. But what are you going to yeah. do? It's part of it. <laughs> one of the things that, that I, one of the lessons that I learned early on and being in, in the, that kind of band was we, when we first started, I, I was super Christian, thought I was, you know, above everybody else. And you, I'm sure you've met Christians who are very looked down their nose at you kind of judgmental. And that's, and that's the way I was. And um, that's kind of, and I've noticed as people that are newly reborn are kind of that way. Until yes, they realize exactly. they need to, they need to pull it back a little bit. But anyway, go ahead. Yeah. But yeah, so we, we started, we were playing churches and it's like, <laughs> this is, we're a metal band. What are we doing in this? And one of the biggest things was we got invited to play this show out at this big festival. And it was the, our 
guitar player was telling the guy, he's like, you know, we're a thrash metal band, right? He's like, oh yeah, we want all kinds of music. We have rappers, we have this, we have that. I'm like, all right. So we get to this festival and it's out in the field and it's, there's people everywhere. The place is packed. And we're like, all oh, right, on. It's going to be a good show. There's lots of people here. We set up our table. We get mugged with all these kids coming up and buying merchandise. And, oh, we love metal. We can't wait to see. And I'm like, well, cool. I'm looking forward to playing to you guys. Oh, we're not going to be able to see you. What? Oh, yeah, the buses are leaving to take us all home at 7. And you guys don't go on until 8. <laughs> what? Huh? It was ridiculous. At least you sold merch. <laughs> It was ridiculous. So then we we did another festival not long after that in another city, and then the same thing. They had us playing, and the band before us was like this acoustic, you know, worship band, whatever you want to call it. And we're like, these people are gonna freak. <laughs> it's all families sitting on blankets and that stuff. Yeah. So we get up on stage and we set up our full stacks, and we're up there, and we you know we, we get going. I mean, we're not even into the first song where there's there's a point in the song where all the whole band members start doing windmills at the same time. <laughs> We didn't even get to that point when the entire crowd back got up and moved back, you know, a hundred yards from us. It was ridiculous. <laughs> I'm like, and after that show, I'm like, this we this is wrong. This is not where we need to be playing. <laughs> pick pick up mean, your sandwich, Tommy, and don't make eye contact. <laughs> yeah. So we started playing clubs. And this is where I learned the lesson about that that whole I'm more Christian than you crap. So we were playing a show and um, it was our gig. We booked it. We were allowed, we were supposed to have three bands. So we asked a buddy of ours who played in another Christian band to play. And then we asked another band of ours who friends of ours in a band called dark truth, who were not Christian band. And they, we made them headline because they, it was their equipment we were using. They had lights and everything. So we, we get up that we get there. The first band opens up and he gets up there and this is in a bar in the middle of the set. He starts preaching a message about, you know, salvation and all this kind of stuff which I don't have, a, I, I didn't have a problem with it coming like, yeah, 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 that's awesome, you know, go for it. And then we get up there and we play, we do our set. Um, I didn't, I never did that on stage. I was always, we were a metal band, so we just played our songs. And then the last band played. Now afterwards, I went to the club owner to get our pay. And he looks at me, he said, I should punch you out and not give you a damn dime. And I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, we had, there was people here everywhere. What's the problem? He goes, that band that you had opened up was up there preaching and telling people not to buy my alcohol. He goes, I had you here to entertain the people drinking. That's what I hired you for, not to be preaching at them, telling them not to drink. And I was like, I apologize. I'm like, yeah, you're right. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I just didn't, I never even thought of it. You know, it's just, I didn't think of it. So yeah, it was, it was an important lesson learned to, to stop being so damn pious and just play your dang music. Yeah. Right on. And the reason I, was, I shared that story is because you reminded me of it by saying hauling the equipment. One of the things that we decided from that point on was when we were playing with any other band coming in from another town, especially when we were, you know, they were lugging all that crap from their vans. One of the things we were going to do is our band was going to help them set up and break down. Didn't matter if we were opening or they were opening. We we're just going to help them. And that opened up a lot of doors and kept me with friends for a lot of bands ever since then. Yeah. Yeah. Good deal. Yep. And um, one more thing to add, to add um you were a part of um vengeance rising members started another band called once dead which was like the name of the last vengeance rising album i, I used to own it um same here you didn't make it on any of the actual albums but you're on return with a vengeance video and then also the live in anaheim which is live with a vengeance live in Ava anaheim cd yeah, that's this, right yeah that right there DVD here yeah yeah how that was something after Ultimatum, or were you two bands were running in? Con two parallel? bands at one time. Um, yeah, oh, I, man. I. It was funny. In, uh, back in I don't know, two thousand four, maybe even earlier than that. I can't remember. We were doing a festival out in California, in Anaheim, and there was another band playing at that festival. I think they were called Salt, and they were kind of like this Creed like band and but in the band playing bass was larry farkas the guitar shredder from vengeance rising mm -hmm. so we we in our set were doing a song called burn by vengeance rising it was a cover that we were just doing live and he actually heard us playing it came up to us backstage afterwards he's like dude if we ever do a vengeance reunion you got to come sing for us and i was like if you ever have a vengeance reason rising reunion give me a call well wouldn't you know <laughs> A few years later, I get the call and they were like, hey, we're going to be doing just one reunion show, which is this thing here, which is supposed to be a one off show. Um, do you want to sing for us? And I'm like, yeah. And it was supposed to be billed as vengeance, but they were starting to have issues with 
Roger Martinez, the original yeah. vocalist. So, I mean, literally the day of the show, they changed it to be Once Dead. Oh, wow. Because the set list from the show actually had the Vengeance logo printed on them. Mm-hmm. But in any case, it ended up, I ended up singing, staying with them for two years. Um, uh, I started writing songs with them for the next, for the new album. I wrote lyrics, song titles. And, um, but then I got what I call the left foot of fellowship out of the band. So, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, ultimatum yeah. was really popular at the time, especially in the Christian metal scene. And a lot of people were buying, pre buying the album who were ultimatum fans and they were buying it off our website. And because I had listed it there to go, you know, direct link. Well, one of the guitar players in the band didn't like the fact that ultimatum was getting, was pushing their sales and people were, it was ultimatum fans who were buying their stuff, basically. Mm. Uh, who cares? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a did. good thing, isn't it? Yeah, that's, I thought so, but he did. He cared, so they they hmm. kicked me out. They actually, what they did was they brought me out to California. They said, "Sing on, a, sing on these demos for us," and uh, so I and they they put the, the song on, and I and I sang it how I would how I was singing it, kind of that almost a death metal growl, like like in Vengeance, hmm. not quite like Ultimatum. And they're like, "Can you sing it like Bon Scott?" Uh, okay. <laughs> so I tried singing it a different way, and my bass player from Ultimatum was actually with me. And then they're like, "Try singing it like this. Try singing it like that. Try singing it like this." I'm like, "This is weird. What are you doing?" And then finally, they're like, "Okay, now sing it how you want to sing it." So I belted it out. They're like, "Sounds good, thanks." And then so I, and then like three, four weeks later, I got the call. You, you, you're gone. You're out. So um, hmm. Hmm. it was it it was all they didn't want to be compared to Ultimatum. That's all there was to it. Uh. And, so instead, they got a metalcore singer and who was a super nice guy, nothing against him at all. But they were playing thrash metal with a metalcore singer, and it just didn't work for me. Mm-hmm. But they ended up not using any of my lyrics. They did use a couple of my song titles, which is is what it is. But um, and they used the idea for one of the songs that I sent them, but they didn't actually use my lyrics. So I ended up taking those lyrics and using them on the Heart of Metal album for uh, Ultimatum when we put it out in 2012. Hmm. So do you miss it? It's been a while. I miss the stage. That's the only thing I miss. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I like I liked being on the stage. You, if you ever, you you've been in bands, so you know. I mean, there's a there's an energy that you feed off the crowd from, and and I loved that. You know, it didn't matter if there was two people in the audience or five hundred people in the audience. You know, I was I, I just there was an energy on stage that we gave off. I walked off stage drenched and exhausted because we always put on the best show we could, no matter who was there. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. I would, I would bring our other guest on, but he got a phone call and he walked, stepped away. So we're going to give it a minute here, but um, well, thanks again. Thanks for coming on. It's been really cool. And people please check out um, Scott's channel. No life till metal. Uh, it's under your name or is it under both? I, I, it's under both, isn't it? No, it's no life till metal. Yeah. My YouTube channel is no life till metal. Links, the links Waters. in the description. Either yep, either way. Roundtable, the Metal Roundtable, go check them out. And of course, um, Ultimatum stuff is readily um, available online to check out. And I think you even have copies of stuff still available, don't you? Yes, all, all of our albums have been repressed on vinyl and CD, and you can get them at just about anywhere, Amazon. But uh, I do know this. It just happened the other day. Boonsoverstock.com has a bunch of our CDs on sale for like $4.88 or something like that. Hmm. $4.88 hmm. each. Wow. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. Well, I'm going to bring Aaron on, and he's just going to have to catch up when he's back. So everybody's going to have to stare at an empty spot here. But um, I've got some obvious questions. This first one is a pretty stupid question. But um, what is it? Christian metal, what is it? Hey, Aaron, you're live, oh, by the sh- way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 to me, it's just metal. It's all metal. Metal is metal everybody's got something to say everybody's got a story to tell everybody's you know it, it's all metal to me i don't care if, if it's you know vengeance rising or venom it's still metal um the only the only difference is the lyrics uh, I, I always found it ridiculous that christian metal became its own genre because it's not there's thrash metal there's death metal there's black metal there's all these different forms of metal with christian singing in them who the heck cares what the label you put on it is um i actually got into a big fight with a record store once because i went in ultimate second album come out puppet of destruction i went into hastings remember that chain yep mm-hmm. i went into hastings because that day the mortifications 
album and the, and the ultimatum album was coming out on the same label at the same time and we had major distributions with diamante at the time so i went in to buy i just wanted i wanted to buy my own album because <laughs> our first album was independent you can only buy it you know through mail order which at the time was literal mail order um but this album was on a label with distribution so i went into hastings and i was like i went to the metal section i found the mortification and then i went to uh look for the ultimatum it wasn't there so i said i went up my ass and said did you guys get the new ultimatum cd and they didn't know i was in the band and uh he said let me look he looked on the computer oh yeah we got it in it's, it's over in the gospel section <laughs> said, the gospel section so i walk over and i look in it and it's in there with like bb and cc winans and and mm -hmm. amy grant and stuff like that and i was like i said it's metal he goes, oh, it's on a gospel label. I said, it's on the same label as this Mortification album. Sorry, but it's gospel. I'm like, okay, whatever. <laughs> it's it's metal. It's all just metal. Right. So, Sir, I'm, you know, I'm telling you, this is a gospel CD. You should not buy it if you don't want a gospel CD. <laughs> oh, you're in the band. <laughs> it was. It's just. It's ridiculous. So That's, I actually, yeah. after he walked away, I grabbed this. I grabbed this because there was three CDs there. I kept one for myself. And the other two, I took them and I put them in the middle section. So. All right. <laughs> But it didn't matter. That meant in every single Hastings, it, it was sitting in the gospel section where no one yeah. was going to find it. I know. I know. For me, when I was younger, you know, when I first started becoming aware of it, and I wasn't brought up religious at all, and I just, for some reason, it offended me. And the more, the older I've gotten, you start looking like all these bands that I like. They're singing about Satan. It's kind of the same wheelhouse. It comes from the same the same belief system the only thing that makes it scary is the people that are singing the christian stuff really do believe it whereas 90 percent of the satanic bands look at venom they didn't believe it that was shock and awe that was not that wasn't yeah, yeah. they're selling they're selling a horror movie you know that's and the that runs got a good idea of what to do with the uh, venom stock there <laughs> <laughs> right but um okay next question we we established what it is um who is it marketed towards? Well, honestly, that's a problem. Because this is this problem. to me is where I used to buy Christian albums in in the in the Rainbow Bookstore, which was a, a, a gospel uh, religious exactly. store. Exactly. Nowhere so, else, just there. Now, this is a story I can tell you direct from Vengeance because I was in the band. They told me this was when they signed to their the light label was Intense Records at the time. I'm sure you remember Intense Records. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now they were they were being distributed by medusa and enigma and um uh capital music so they were that's what they well right after they signed with them the the label got bought out by a christian label and it became a strictly christian label and started being sent into bookstores vengeance were beside themselves angry with the whole thing because they were like what's the point of that if if you're if you're honestly a Christian, you're trying to reach the world and tell them the good news, right? The gospel. You're not trying to go into churches and, and tell youth kids that already know it. Up. So to me, it's always been marketed to the wrong. Again, it's metal. It should be marketed as metal. It's not its own genre. And it really, I mean, if they want, if they truly want the, the word to get out there, I mean, I'm friends of mine here in town are in this band. In fact, TJ is the singer for my band, The Glorious Dead, and guitar player. Well, not my band, it's our band, but the so band like that I'm in. Yeah, Feast Eternal. Yeah, okay, I know them. Yeah, TJ's in The Glorious Dead, and I, I've heard all this stuff, and we've talked round and round back in the day about preaching to the converted. It makes no sense, but I, I think if they truly wanted their message to get out better, it's best just to not even mention being Christian. Let people get into the damn lyrics and say, Discover oh, oh, wait a minute, what the hell is this? If you got a big sticker on it, if you like Metallica, you'll love Tourniquet or whatever the mm -hmm. fuck it was when you were in the Rainbow Bookstore. They had, if mm -hmm. you like this band, check out this band, you know, type. They they marketed it towards the converted. And that's... They're marketing it is second rate, too. You know, that's what's really... Only effective. second rate. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because it's saying, if you like this, then here's a substitute for it. You know what I mean? It's like... If you if you if you're out of sugar, you know you can use corn syrup, but it's not going to be as good, right? It's not going to be the same thing. It's right. Yeah, it's 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 it was definitely marketed improperly, incorrectly, and and it it's gotten better, but it's it it's, has gotten better, but it's still it's I still see that going on that same and some of it's not propagated by the labels, it's propagated by some of the bands. They want to be playing in front of the youth groups. Which I guess it's easy. A, it's because it's easy. That's the easy road. It just is. 
Yeah, and I and I guess there's a market for that too. You want to, you know, but at the same time, it's if they're, if your point is spreading a message, then you're 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 not spreading anything if you're just telling it to people who already know the message. Yeah, yeah. this so. is, brings up a great story. I one year at Metal Fest, Milwaukee Metal Fest, I was there covering it for Maniacs, and I went in to watch Living Sacrifice. Mm -hmm. I don't own any Living Sacrifice. I heard a lot about. I heard some stuff. I heard they were a good thrash band. I knew they were Christian. I went in there and those dudes, there was about a half pack room and they were, they were in the lion's den. And I, and I tip my hat to them for that. I, I mean, I'm not a Christian, but I re, I have respect for people that are, you know, strong in their convictions and believe in what they, but great, whatever gets you through the day. But these guys were up there kicking ass and in between songs, they're getting Jesus sucks. And you know, the, the guy's like, Hey, what's your opinion, man? check out this next song you know i'm just like they did they just let it roll off their shoulder and they went and they kicked ass and i just thought you know what cheers to those guys because they're not playing the youth groups they're they're in playing the metal shows they're playing they're where they're supposed to be doing what they're supposed to be doing in front of their people whether they people into the evil bands want to admit it or not christian metal bands are your people too they're metal heads it's just mm -hmm. the way it is. And, then, and you know, this early marketing of the Christian metal stuff, they were trying to market to not metal heads. They're trying to market towards, I don't know, you know, kids that are, you know, they're afraid they're going to get, you know, during the satanic panic, get sucked away by Satan. And I don't know. Do the kids even know what Metallica is? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. You know, I didn't, I would, I would go into rainbow bookstore just to see what metal, tapes they had there i'm looking mm -hmm. around and i'm looking people are looking at me like i'm from another planet so it's like yeah i got the same problem and i yep. was a christian i walked right. into the christian bookstores not to get looked at because i had the long hair leather jacket though you know and yep. you're a freak what are you doing in our store but <laughs> it is you know i never cared <laughs> okay next question let's talk about quality that to me that that to me that question might seem simple, but it means a little bit more to me. I don't know who wants to start. Quality, take it however you want to take it. Quality of these bands. I'm thinking, born back in my day, back in the day. Well, I'll start. I'll start. <laughs> um, for me, this kind of goes into the next thing. I'm going to talk about our origin stories. It, it, there was a lady that took over the college radio metal show named Lee Metcalf. She started um, playing nothing but christian bands and i'll be honest there were some good some great christian bands some awesome ones but there were way more mediocre ones and that's you know, i'm looking through some of the christian lists going before picking stuff out i'm seeing a lot of albums i used to own and got rid of because i didn't like them because they just didn't they either had a weak production and it, 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 it infringed upon the music or the bands themselves were a weaker carbon copy of the bands they were trying to emulate. I don't know. What do you guys think? Scott, why don't you start? Um, I think a lot of it was the bands who got the most exposure were those bands that others were trying to, that were trying to copy other bands. Uh, and the Christian labels were looking for that. And that's what they were putting out there. So that's the stuff that got the exposure. Yeah. Um, there was a lot of great bands who, Never got the time of day. The labels wouldn't touch them with a you know ten foot pole, which was ridiculous. Um, I can give you a list of you know five thrash bands off the top of my head that are freaking killer. Never could get a label, no matter what they did, they couldn't get a label to pick them up. Um, I've got friends in a band called the Moshketeers. They um, they were around in the eighties. They toured around with um, what's the name of that band? Baron Cross um, and mm. the Messiah Prophet and. Uh, what was that three guitar band that didn't uh, not a Christian band, but the three guitar army band that uh, at war at at war? Huh? Molly no, Hatch. no, the three guitars, I mean, a three guitar metal band. If I, oh, three guitar me, metal band. Yeah, the guitar player, the singer played guitar and and played sang and played guitar. Hmm. Anyhow, hmm. whatever. So hmm. he, they toured and they weren't. They toured around with all these bands. They were doing great. They got flown out to California. Some label flew them out there, had them do some premier shows, um, wined and dined them, said they were going to sign them, and then ended up not. And just just nothing. And then instead signed some horrible band. Like, what was the one you and I, Aaron, that you said you uh, you, you grabbed the show? Um, Torn Flesh. Torn Flesh, yeah. 
yeah, a, a band like that got signed to the label and not the Mosketeers. And, and least, just, just so we're clear, I recognize that Torn Flesh is a low quality band. Like Sorry. when I say I love that record, I say that as a connoisseur of shit, not as an AR person. Yeah, it's 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 a pretty corny record. <laughs> I, I don't even own it. So um but I, that's what I think it is. But labels like like I grabbed this just for that reason, because I had a feeling it would come up. But have you ever seen this compilation? I this actually really like that comp a lot. Yeah, it's it's called uh, what, Heavy Righteous Metal compilation. But you can actually see from this, like half the bands on here are good and the other half are terrible. One of the bands on here called Tempest. You heard them, right, Aaron? They're pretty they're, bad, yeah. They're pretty bad. But here's the deal with like Tempest. A band called Tempest, who is a thrash band, sent their, their demo into pure metal label to get, you know, for hoping they get signed. They liked it, but they didn't put their dang address on the thing. So the label went looking for Tempest. And ended up signing this band instead, which was oh. a a glammy, I don't know, like like a poor man's motley crew, and uh, that's how they got signed. And they were they're they're just not that good. <laughs> and then they've got this band on here called Rosanna's Raiders. Now, there's nothing wrong with Rosanna's Raiders if you like, you know, just female fronted hard rock, like say like Heart. But mm -hmm. to put them on a metal compilation. You can see why people wouldn't like it and would think, oh, that's garbage. It doesn't belong. In. So it, some of it is just bad decisions by these labels signing bands that didn't have any right to be signed. They would just some of them just weren't even ready yet. Yeah. I mean, they were just they signed them too early. They, they hadn't found a sound or found a style, you know. Um, OK. Anybody else have anything they want to add to that? Uh, the quality part, Alan, Aaron? Yeah, I'll throw in two cents. I agree yeah. with what folks have said. Um, you know, for me, there was you know a distinction could often be made. You could figure out pretty quickly, you know, not just in terms of you know musical capability, but it wasn't too hard to figure out which bands were there strictly to try to preach to you versus which people were there because they honestly liked that style of music they were playing, and you know, that of course made all the difference in the world. It was just some people thinking how can we reach those kids today? Oh, I know. Pick up some rocking guitars and spread the word to them. That always, you know, shown through real fast because yeah, the musical quality wouldn't be there. And, you know, those were often the bands where the lyrics, you know, became very pre just song after song after song. They sounded kind of like, you know, just converted Sunday school songs. And, here's and the thing. I just there were just too many of those, but yeah, then you'd, you know, could find the other bands where it's like, these people are actually bona fide heavy metal fans that are, yeah, just have different lyrical content. And those would be, you know, the better bands that you'd want to dive into. I didn't have that particular uh, comp, Scott, that you showed. The one that uh, uh, my, you know, friends and stuff in high school started circulating, and I only have them on old cassettes now, are the Heaven's Metal comps mm -hmm. from Intense. Uh, yeah, I've got Volumes 1 and Volume 3 on tape still. And, yeah, you know, quality-wise, they're all over the place. Stylistically, the bands are all over the place. So... Yeah, you kind of had to, you know, sort through the stuff. You know, for every band that would just sit there for four minutes repeating, "He is the rock," "He is the rock," "We rock, love rock Jesus," rock. "He is rock." But you know, then you know, three songs later, you'd be like, "Whoa, here's a band that actually can rock out," and there may be a Christian message in the lyrics, but that's not their emphasis. They're a metal band with Christian lyrics, not a group of trying to get other people into Christianity by pretending they like, you know, metal, trying to pantomime that they like heavy music to appeal to you know, the, the troubled youth of the day or something. So, yeah, that was kind of, you know, how we uh, tended to approach it. You know, is this band, you know, got some chops, you know, and are, are they putting the music first or are they putting the message first? It, that was always a big distinction for us. Yeah. See, I got to put the contrarian a little bit here. Sure. Because, this record, I just listened to this earlier. Oh, that's a good one. I forgot to pull that one. <laughs> Dude, this record now, if if which one is it, Aaron? It's it's final acts. I, I was taking the plastic off. I'm trying to get better about this because I always leave the fucking plastic on. Okay, so Beyond Hell's Gate by Final Acts, which I guess is like a demo or something from '89, but this label Steel Legacy. 
did a reissue of it and they did a whole bunch of shit that I love. I kind of think they're like one of the underrated reissue labels. But anyway, um, th this, if you're, if you're like put off by the whole preachy thing, or if like that is separate from like good, like metal for you, then, you know, you might not be up for this one because this one is really preachy and really in your face that way. And like really specific too, you know, like, um, you know, baptized in blood and, you know, blind faith and that sort of thing. Okay. Are you ready? You know, but then like soldier of compromise is like attacking people who are like Christian. If they're not like strong enough, like if they're not like forceful enough as Christians, you know what I mean? So this record is really heavy handed, but I swear this is one of my favorites. This record is so good. Phil mentioned he's a great guitar player. Great thing rocks. And I'll tell you, these guys might have spent half the show preaching, but I'll bet it was a great show regardless because they were they were doing something right in the music department, even if maybe their priorities are a little misplaced from my point of view, you know, because I'd want to put the music over it. The other thing you could say about the Christian metal bands is they had way less money to produce the music than a lot of the mainstream bands had. Mm. Um, so they were a lot of them, even back in the 80s, were self-producing their albums. Um, so the quality of recordings was definitely an issue. And there was also the issue of it, the message was more important than the music. Um, I always saw that and I still see it to this day. Um, I have a really good friend who plays in a band that I love from Pennsylvania and they were fairly well known in the eighties. I'm not going to say their name cause I don't want to embarrass him, but they put out a new album a few years ago and he sent it to me to listen to. And I, and I listened to it. I'm like, this is unmemorable. This is like this. It sounds like a, almost sounded like a guy preaching a message at church and there was music playing in the background behind him. There was no hooks, no memorable stuff, really good prog metal behind him. But the whole thing just fell apart because the guy was just preaching a message over top of it. And I had no idea what he was saying. Uh, and I, and there was nothing memorable. You turned it off, done. So I think that is definitely a, a problem with that style because the message is so important to them. That's what they concentrate on rather than music. Yeah. And I think that's I think that's a problem with a lot of Christian stuff, Christian film industry. My goodness, there's some terrible Oops. Christian movies out there. Again, the message is more important than the, than the than the delivery. But if the delivery is bad, I've said it over and over again. No one's going to listen to it. No one's going to watch it. Mm -hmm. So I, yep, exactly. that was never my thing. Ultimatum was a metal band. And I told people that all the time. We are a bunch of metal fans in a metal band. That's what it is. Well, you guys sing Christian message. Yeah, that's because I'm a Christian and I write the lyrics. So <laughs> and yeah. not every song was Heart of Metal is just a song, you know, fist bumping song about heavy metals. It's, we just wrote what we wanted to write about. So anyhow, that's my take on it. Well, um, we've all kind of like. I, I had or we probably need to start showing records here. We're going on almost an hour, jibber jabber. But um <laughs> sorry, I can I can definitely talk if you can't tell. No, no, it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've already mentioned how I got in started hearing uh Christian bands, and it was through that that radio show. Um Aaron, let's start with you. What's uh what was your origin story into this style of music? Well, it's funny to start with me because mine's like backwards here, but I'm actually really into telling the story, especially because I'm seeing people watching who are like, yeah, I never paid any attention to this stuff and blah, blah, and this and that. Because I was right there in that boat, okay? I listened to Striper back then, and I really wanted to like Striper because, you know, I was so believed then, and I wasn't that kind of Protestant, so I didn't completely understand it, honestly. I, I see that in retrospect. I didn't see that at the time. But... um. I just thought they sucked, man. I just thought they were crap. And like, I remember that I had one friend where all he listened to was Christian bands, but like, it's so, like we were just talking about this, it's so ghettoized already. Like that just did that even more. It was like only from him that I ever heard of bands like Bride or, you know, some of these other ones that where I got the names and sort of got a little bit of passing exposure. But to me, it was all kind of crap and second rate until years later when I really sort of got deeper into collecting. And, you know, I had all sort of the noise and the, I mean, of course, the obvious shit, right? But then, like, you know, at the point where you have all the other noise records and Metal Blade records and shit, and you're looking for more stuff. So I started going down this private press path. And lo and behold, there's some really, like, cool and sought-after records that are Christian, you know? So, well, you know, maybe, maybe I'll overlook some that aren't, like, hundreds of dollars. And sure enough, you know, the more I, I found some that I really liked, you know, I sort of dipped a toe in with like, you know, early bride yep. and like, um, 
I mean, that Messiah record just always bubbles to the surface. That's one of my favorites. But some of those kinds of bands, right? And then sort of with time, I was able to sort of uh, build my way up to like Messiah Prophet and some of these other ones. I still like Slayer. I mean, Slayer, uh, Striper. But I have a lot of appreciation for a lot of these bands now, including a lot that I really used to hate. Like, I mean, and some where I really uh, had a low opinion of when it's funny talking about this in front of Scott because he's like my sensei when it comes to stuff. But I thought I'd written off Blood Good because their first record was so bad, and Scott put me onto their second record, which is really good. And their third record's pretty good too. But um, yeah, that's sort of the story. I came to it really late. I, I really just came to it within like the last 20 years or so, which means, you know, well after the stuff was over. And my appreciation for it has only grown and really sort of exponentially since I've gotten to know Scott, because I didn't even know some of these bands like, you know, Vengeance that just seem obvious to me now or, you know. My my favorite video that Aaron ever has ever done is was one of the early ones that he did, the Jesus Metal one. I'm sure it's still up. I've watched that video. I've probably watched that video 10, 12 times, and I still laugh every time I watch it. <laughs> I feel like that's the video where I made my reputation. <laughs> I really think it is because, he. I mean, he's talking about Christian metal. He's calling it Jesus metal, and every other word is, is this fucking jam, this fucking band, this fucking – and it was – it just worked. So it was like <laughs> – comedic genius I, I, I loved it it's just so awesome but the one thing the other thing about it was is the stuff he was showing i'm like oh that's a horrible album oh that's a terrible yeah. album and Scott, it, and i don't know like, if you've noticed aaron shows a lot of horrible albums and he keeps them because he thinks it's funny <laughs> i i have this album but sucks but I, did, just, I love having it type of thing <laughs> but some of the ones he was showing are just so bad they're like <laughs> un unlistenable bad you know what i mean it was just bad yeah. So I was like, oh, I got to turn you on to some 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 of the different stuff because one of the other things about Christian metal is I honestly think it was always five years behind what everybody else was doing. So yeah. when true when, tradi when traditional power metal was and heavy metal was no longer you know a thing by the mid '80s and thrash metal was taken over, there was a ton of great Christian metal bands coming out in that style. And then when thrash was kind of dying out in 89 90 91 well that's when there was a ton of christian thrash bands out there doing great writing great music and it wasn't that these bands weren't around earlier they just couldn't get on a dang label because the labels were what was five years behind everybody else right. right well since you're up scott what's your origin story behind all this stuff i discovered striper when i was in college i was i went into the bookstore i mean, into the bookstore into the record store and i'm like i went up to the guy working there and and i was like what's new dude and he's like he's like hey check out this band striper and i'm like oh cool what do they sound like he goes man i like everything from metallica to the monkeys he goes if you like anything in that area you'll dig these guys and it was the soldiers under command record it would just come out mm -hmm. and i that was kind of it however i grew up in the church and I grew up in a youth group and I was kind of the, the rebel in the youth group. So I went to church wearing my Aerosmith and the who and Jimi Hendrix and all those different shirts. And I didn't really give a crap, Jack Daniels, whatever else I was wearing at the time. Um, so the church hated me. Um, they never wanted me there. And I didn't find that out until after I left, but uh, I kept going anyhow. And my youth pastor who I'm friends with to this day, wonderful guy, he was always trying to turn me on to other music. So he turned me on to, Petra and Rez and Phil Kagi and that kind of stuff that was more mainstream rock, not metal. So I really started getting into it back then. And there was some great stuff. Phil Kagi is just one of the greatest guitar players ever. He really is. It's not I'm not just saying that. Um, so that's where I kind of started was with that whole youth group scene and my youth pastor pushing that stuff on me because all the other kids in my youth group were listening to Sandy Patty and uh, BJ Thomas. And I'm like, that don't sound like the who I, 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 why are you push, giving me this stuff you know <laughs> so yeah i was the only thing i did like petra and i still do like some petra but even that you know wasn't especially back then the 70s petra stuff was nowhere near you know a led zeppelin or a black sabbath which is what mm -hmm. i was listening to or a ted nugent you know <laughs> yeah so anyhow that's that's i mean i kind of like i said i grew up in the church so i kind of started learning from it from there but then uh when i actually became a christian myself i delved in 1989, I delved and dove deep into it, looking for stuff. I, I just wanted anything that had that message to it, so I bought a lot of stuff back then. Right on. I call it I call it my super Christian days because <laughs> I, I got involved. I got involved in a church that was very strict and very almost cultish uh, in a way because they they 
were very strict on what we could and couldn't do. And they were always pounding on me about my music. And I let them get in my head and I got rid of my entire collection in 1990. Sold it all off. Um, do I regret it? Not really, because I, I used the money to buy a house, um, to put a down deposit on a house. So I don't really regret it. But then at the same time, I kind of do because I got rid of a lot of stuff I'll never get back again. Yeah. So anyhow, whatever though. I mean, it, it is what it is. You made I up for complain. it. Look around. <laughs> I can't complain. I'm looking around. I've got hundred. I've got thousands of records and even more CDs than I can even deal with. So, yeah. like I told you before the show, I literally gave away 800 CDs a few weeks ago. <laughs> wow. I, I just had so many of them. I mean, I, yeah. yep. All right, Alan, your origins into this world. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, my origins growing up, you know, in the rural South, religion, of course, is a very dominant force. You know, it was a town of 2000 people and there were probably like, you know, one church per five people per capita or something. Uh, you know, that's, it's a huge thing. And, you know, a lot of it was, you know, I did not grow up in a particularly religious household, so it wasn't that. But, you know, I had lots of friends who did. And back to sort of a point you made earlier, Marty, for a lot of those kids, they did want to listen to contemporary music. They wanted to listen to what the other kids at school were listening to, which was heavier stuff. You know, True. That's a good in, point. In the 1980s, you know, metal was very mainstream, or at least relatively mainstream. And so, you know, they he heard this stuff in the background and they liked it musically, whether it was Motley Crue or Metallica or anything in between, but they were not allowed to. You know, someone in the comments uh, a moment ago made that same comment. I think it was Sunday. Uh, Sunday was the first part of their name. You know, mentioning that was all they Sunday were. Sunday morning allowed. sessions. Yeah. Sunday morning sessions. Yes. Sorry. I got that. Um, you know, made the comment that was all they were allowed to listen to. And that was the case for some of my friends that if it was not Christian music, they were not allowed to listen to it. They weren't allowed to have it in the house. They weren't allowed to hear it. They literally got in serious trouble with their parents if they were caught with that kind of stuff can i can i interrupt you for just one second oh yeah please go, j jump right in scott go well, ahead the, the, what you're saying right now that's how the church i was going to was to the point where they said if you brought that music into your house you were literally inviting demons into your house because you mm -hmm. brought and, and they weren't even talking like the stuff i was listening to <laughs> they weren't even talking slayer and venom you know they were talking if you brought a beatles record into your house you were inviting satan into your house mm, literally yep. So anyhow, yeah. sorry, I had to. Oh no, no, that's that's a good example. Yeah, I mean, I had a friend. I had given her, I, you know, the live uh, Halloween EP. You know, and Halloween's about as far from anything satanic. You know, it's almost it's got a Christian undertone. Well, a lot of those you know, guys are Christian. Christian. Yeah, and yeah. very much. You know, uh, her parents found the tape, made her call me on the phone, <laughs> and, and stood over her shoulder while she, you know, basically feeding her lines to tell me that. Uh, she did not listen to that kind of music. She did not like that kind of music. And she didn't want to, you know, like associate with people who listen to that kind of music anymore. And, uh, you know, not to, you know, like call her or give her tapes ever again. And, you know, she, you know, that's this whole phone call. I'm just like, this is weird. I'm just going to kind of play along. Like, okay. Sorry about that. Okay. No big deal. And it wasn't, you know, until much later, you know, where she could kind of, you know, get off that, you know, uh, out from under that surveillance. And she's like, I'm so sorry that whole thing happened. Just let me, I'm like, yeah, I kind of thought something like that might've been going on. So sorry. I got you in trouble with a Halloween tape, you know, <laughs> uh, but I mean, that's the level it was working with, you know? So like I said, anyway, you know, those kids wanted to listen to something that sounded like the music everybody else was listening to, but <laughs> they, John, they knew we, <laughs> not Halloween. That's fucking hilarious. John, thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, sorry. so uh yeah you know as christian you know metal started you know trickle out there and then more and more came out you know it was you know perfect for that group of kids you know it had you know the it kind of sounded like stuff that everybody else at school was listening to but it had the right messaging that they could get it past their parents like no 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 i'm not going into camelot to buy music i'm going into I, yeah there was you know it wasn't rainbow but there was a different you know, small chain of Christian bookstores in the South. Yeah. And like, no, no, I'm going in here. You're... And again, these are families like, you know, the parents would follow the kid in and watch what they would buy. It wasn't like mm -hmm. they could sneak anything. But if they're buying it in the Christian bookstore, did they didn't even glance at the cover art. They didn't even 
think anything about it. You're buying it in here. It's perfectly fine and sanctified. Go right ahead. Um, and so, yeah, you know, they'd end up with, you know, mortification tapes and, you know, vengeance uh, rising tapes and, you know, all this other stuff because that's, that's, you know, the only thing they could really access. Um, you know, my best friend who's, uh, was hopefully tuning David, if you're out there, uh, cheers. You know, his situation wasn't quite, you know, that extreme, but, you know, he was, you know, uh, you know, very devout Christian, super nice guy. We've been friends you know, basically since sixth grade. And you know, he liked some, you know, non-religious music, but, you know, yeah, the Christian metal, you know, had kind of an extra special appeal for him. So, you know, we had kind of a good back and forth. You know, he would tape, you know, all the Christian metal stuff for me that he'd pick up, like these heaven metal tapes I showed earlier. Yeah, and I would tape any good, you know, uh, secular heavy metal stuff for him, and because again, and in his uh, house, you know, he could listen to other stuff. You know, he wasn't under that strict uh, a household rule. So a lot of the stuff I heard was you know through David um, trading tapes back and forth, and then when we moved apart for college, you know, we still mailed stuff back and forth all the time to check out different bands and things like that. So yeah, he kind of helped me keep my, uh, yeah finger on the pulse of, you know, what was happening with Christian metal bands, you know, and you know, I, I sent him the other stuff and back and forth. So we had kind of a good pipeline that went there for a long time. And that's kind of my origin story. Later on, like Aaron said, you know, I started to become aware that, yeah, even some of the private press and indie stuff was also, you know, coming from a Christian, uh, you know, musician standpoint. And we'll probably show a few of those here in just a few minutes. Right on. And um, let's start showing some records. And I want to say, so far, it bodes well for the rest of the uh, stream that I haven't been struck by lightning yet. <laughs> We're good. The last funeral and wedding I went to, safe and sound, all good. Things are things are looking up. <laughs> um, so yeah, let's let's uh, talk about some faves. Um, and before we get going, we'll have you start, Scott. Um, we'll probably just do one at a time, go around in a circle until we're depleted. I think Scott's okay. the one that wins the day with the most pulled. So um, towards the end, you can start showing a bunch. But um, my Christian metal collection is pretty lacking. Pretty lacking. I got some classics. I've got um, – I was going through some lists and realized there's a lot of stuff over the years of doing Worm Gear Zine. There are a lot of things I've heard that I got rid of because I thought it was crap. I kept the good stuff, got rid of the garbage, and – I will say it looks like nowadays things are looking up a little bit. The the quality is certainly even some classic bands are putting out some really killer records these days. It's kind of encouraging. But anyway, Scott, let's start with you. What, what's your first poll for the night? I'm gonna actually show two because they're related. Go for so it. This is actually the album I discovered a lot of those bands on. This is because I mean back in the day, Metal Massacre and the you know all those metal compilations that metal masker being the first one that comes to mind but this is the one that got me into a lot of the bands early on was this california yep. metal series mm. this california metal one california metal two and then i didn't grab the vinyl but here's the east coast metal so these three compilations were really what got me into a lot of these bands because i mean this is 86 or so this has got deliverance guardian hero mastodon neon cross and baron cross on it um which is all actually pretty quality stuff there's not really anything bad on here um funny thing uh glenn rogers is who's a buddy of mine um he actually was in two of these bands he was in hero and deliverance at the time so um then he went on to be in hyrax for years and years oh yeah but this one's got soldier emerald uh which is how i discovered emerald a band called ransom out of uh the la scene yeah vision good. who is who became known who were actually malachi before that Do you have that malachi record the malachi one yeah. The, I, just the reissue. I, mean, I don't have like an original. I, I forgot. To, I should have pulled that. I forgot to pull it. Anyhow, Judea and, oh, and one I of my favorite bands is on here, Recon. A band called Recon out of, uh, out of, also out of Southern California. Great power metal band. This one here had, um, a band, had a punk band on there called The Lead, but it also had a band called Believer who I was just like blown away by. So anyhow, that's my that's the one for the ones I thought I'd show first, just because of these compilations, which are kind of hard to find these days, I think, but they're what really got me into a lot of these bands, and I started looking for you know their actual albums after that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those right. were popular. That was a popular comp uh, for a lot of folks. Caught. That's a good good one to start with. Hey, before we get Aaron on, cheers to everybody. We got over ninety people. Awesome. Thanks for hanging out with us tonight. 
great to see you as always. We appreciate you guys every week. Yeah, for sure. lots of good, uh, lots of good comments floating in the chat. I'm trying to type response. Yeah, some are pretty funny. I mean, that's why I'm like laughing at him. Heck of a comments. <laughs> All right, Aaron, what do you got? All right, well, I pulled this one out because this is just sort of a personal favorite that I like that I like to hype. And um, is this a know, terrible record that you keep just just to be a, a Judas, or is this a <laughs> or what? Well, it's it's about as good as this guy. Looks. <laughs> that is fucking awesome. <laughs> hey, he's kind of got Steve Grimmett's hairdo there back in the day. <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, you know, like if one of the Duke boys, yeah, went for the full mullet. <laughs> so I'm going with this one first because even though it's a little bit of a corny record, I love this record. This one is awesome, and the fact is, Which one I like that record a lot too. Yeah, this, this is a Neon Cross record. Okay, yeah. Never if mind. I ask guys, just by the way, if I ask one thing I've noticed is watching some of these episodes back, sometimes we forget to say what it is, and then listening to it, people have no idea what the hell we're talking about. <laughs> so apologies if I no. nag about uh, uh, naming what album we're showing. Uh, so good, point, about, good point, good point. I kind of came to how I went having been raised Orthodox, that like I didn't always get Protestants. And like the idea of naming your band Neon Cross is something pious didn't make sense to me. To me, that was disrespectful. You'd be like, you know, you put the cross in neon. You know what I mean? You, it's, you, you're respectful, you know? So that's, that was already bizarre to me. But the other thing is the label Regency, pure metal tends to take flack for having kind of the corniest and kind of the lowest common denominator Christian bands. But for my money, Regency is worse because it was Regency that had bands like, uh, that contagious free indeed record and that sort of thing. God, so that album. comp just there, I've been like keeping an eye out for that. Those were all over the place when I lived in LA and I was like, ah, oh, yeah, I'll do one when I have buck burning a hole in my pocket. And now I can't find it. And it's eating at me because that one and this one right here redeem the Regency label. As far as I'm concerned, I love this shit. I do too. This record though. And that guy that you showed in that picture that with the, in the corner, I believe he's the drummer. He was in the band for that record and out of the band soon after. Really? I got kind of a cool story about those guys, but I played a bunch of shows with them. They were actually an L.A. band playing on the strip during the whole when that you know whole strip scene was huge. And uh, they weren't obviously you heard it. It's not they're not playing the glam thing. It's just right. straight up metal. Um, and they were so pissed when they saw Motley Crue get signed to a major label. Not just them, but he told me all the bands are pissed. They're like our singer is so much better. We put on such, these, these guys suck. How are they getting, how are they getting signed to a, a major label? Cause I guess Vince Neil really couldn't sing and he was horrible. Live he still can. I mean, he did not age well. Yes. So anyhow, I was just, I, I just found it amusing hearing the stories about the strip back then and how all the bands were so pissed that, you know, a band like Motley Crue got signed and they didn't. Yeah. <laughs> Alan. Let's see. All right. Um, I'll start with another comp, but it wasn't strictly a Christian comp. It just had at least one or two Christian bands on it. It's a Pacific Metal Project. Uh, this one, as the name implies, featured a lot of bands from the West Coast. And one in particular who were included way down here on side B, if I can get it uh, to show Focus. here. Sorry. <laughs> oh, which way do I have to move? This way. That way. Yeah. There you are. There we are. Okay. I think I've got my hand in front of it. There we go. I've got the microphone in a weird place tonight. Uh, this band with this horrible logo of X I N R, which is called, which, uh, was pronounced X Sinner. I'm not yep. sure how they expected anyone to know that based on that spelling. But uh, Ever Present Angel, it's a good song. The band seemed pretty cool and they could have gone somewhere, but uh, tragically, a couple of members were killed. And as such, you know, the band fell apart pretty early before they could gain any traction. Um, much later on, they did record some stuff, and that's been put out on anthologies later. This is one on Stormspell Records. Stormspell uh, rules. That's Beyond cool label. Woodward. Stormspell's good at digging up some of these old things for sure. And uh, yep, you know he does all his own graphic design, so you know his covers are always pretty nice and pretty easy to spot. So yeah, there's you know some uh, nice liner notes in here, and uh, you know some of the tracks on here are very good. Uh, they're uh, it's funny, not a band you would immediately peg as you know, a Christian metal project, just listening to the music because they've got a pretty wild over the top sound on some of this stuff. Uh, like the song Halloween is about <laughs> like, you know, going to graveyards and digging up, uh, you know, dead bodies. 
Not sure if there's a resurrection angle they were trying to play with that or just coming up with a creepy song to mix in with the others. But yeah, some cool tunes, you know, some very almost, you know, wacky, uh, you know, over the top kind of metal stuff uh, from a band that had some potential, but uh, they didn't get to realize it. Uh, there's at least one other comp, if I remember right, that's got their tracks on it. So if you can't find the Storm Spell one for some reason, you can also check Discogs. And I think they've done one other anthology release by X Center. Really easy logo to spot. Uh, again, X I N R. So, yeah, there's yeah, a, vinyl a, version. Metal there's comp. a vinyl version out too. Because I have it. Yes, there is. Yep. And just uh, one thing to note on the Pacific Metal Comp, there's a band called Ransom on here, but it's not the LA Ransom from that, you know, that was a Christian band. It's a completely different Ransom. And I'm not sure if any of the other bands on here are Christian or not, but it also has an Air Apparent song. So, uh, you know, there's uh, DC LaCroix. So there's a couple of those kind of, you know, you know second tier metal bands. So it's not a bad compilation uh, to pick up for some other stuff besides just the X Center song. Can I answer a question from one of the guys on here? Um, sure. Oh, yeah. Go Rex, ahead. Zachary. No, that's not the same as X Center, the band that spells it X dash Center. It's mm -hmm. two different bands. This that the show one he showed is much more straight ahead metal, whereas X Center is more like a mixture of Def Leppard and Crocus mm -hmm. or ACDC. Yep. Thanks for catching that uh, question, Scott. Yeah, two different bands for sure. Um, Tom, thanks a lot for the super chat. Really appreciate you, man. Thanks. Yes, thank you, Tom. Very sweet of you. Oh, appreciate it. Post it again. Let here. me let me say something real quick. The guy who's Rex Zachary, this guy who's asking us all the questions. He's, mm -hmm. the, he's the artist that painted this uh, our cover. Oh, right on. Oh, cool. right on. Nice. Yeah, so in the, <coughs> he painted that that image, and it's definitely our most popular album. <laughs> Very nice. Killer. Sorry. I don't get it. Sorry. Man. You know, that's, that's one area where Ultimatum is just like any other metal band. You have a cover like that, it's going to sell more than a cover like, uh, you know. <laughs> what's What's the one that's just like red that has a sort of explosion on it or something you know you got the demon guy that's going to sell records <laughs> people like will buy it just for that that's right all right my first poll is super obvious but out of the uh, old wnmc days when um lee would play nothing but christian metal this was a band that kind of kicked my ass believer extraction Absolutely. from Mortality. And this mm -hmm. is the actual NMW NMC promo from that radio station. I had yeah. a friend that was had a show there, and I rated their records. And um, there was a handful of records left over that I saved from the from obscurity. I need to try to get the dudes on after this. Has oh, that yeah. been reissued, Scott? Because if not, it's a damn shame. We are trying desperately to get this one reissued. There are some roadblocks. But it's in the works. Let um, me know we... because I would like a non gummed up copy, I, and I still have my original. My original tape that I bought back in the day that I got from the the Christian bookstore, Rainbow Rainbow Bookstore. Yeah, so that, yeah, those are that, that's a great album. It's a great I can, album. I can attest to the fact that Scott's been working with those believers for years too. I've been talking about those for a long time. <laughs> See, I have not heard I have not heard anything past Dimensions or their third. I have not heard anything past their third album. All this new stuff, I, I have not heard any of it. I don't know. I didn't pull this out. I just had to, had to have it find me because I actually worked on these. But if you like that album, check this one out. Is this that Gabriel? Is Gabriel? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, that's Gabriel. Gabriel yeah, yeah, it's it's on. It was Metal Blade release. It's freaking fantastic, and it's even better on that vinyl because the the original album was lacking in the mastering, and the mastering on here, the bottom end, just, just it'll destroy your speakers. It's awesome. Right on. <laughs> nice. Yeah, yeah. Believe someone made the comment here about get, Believer being a good gateway band, and that is very true. You know, as y'all spoke about earlier, sometimes you know, early on, you know, and even into the later '80s, quality could be an issue, or there was always the stereotype, at least, that Christian metal bands weren't as good. And Believer was one of those bands that really did help start to dismiss that stereotype a bit. I remember that getting reviewed in a couple of different zines back in the day, and you know, they literally would start out being like, "Yo, know, yes, this is a Christian metal band." But trust us, you want to hear this band. Well, you, this is just a good heavy metal album. Uh, yeah, to check they out. When they were talking about like Dimensions and some of the and uh, the second album uh, and stuff. So yeah, Sanity Believer. Obscure. Yeah, Believer did a yeah yeoman service kind of in uh, helping obscure. give some legitimacy Sanity and obscure. get a lot of other people to check out uh, a Christian metal band. Yeah, we talked earlier about you know 
reaching, going, not in, playing for the youth groups. They were one that was, I mean, they went out and toured with, um, what was it uh, Sacrifice and Bolt Thrower? I mean, awesome. You know, so that, yeah, that was, that was, they weren't interested in playing, you know, youth groups. So, yeah. Anyhow. Mm-hmm. And, I, and, I, and, I, and they could have mention, played on that tour. They, they, they actually, they're, they're not out of place on that bill so much. <laughs> and I did not mention uh, Extraction for Mortality is the name of the album by Believer. Sorry. But Alan's right. We need to not assume and say the name of the album. I forget. That's that right there is a grail for me. I've been trying to get that. That's the only one I'm missing on vinyl. The one there. I feel a little guilty that I have this and you don't. I just kind of lucked into this. And I don't really deserve it compared with you, but this is indeed a fantastic album. Dear Aaron, mm-hmm. stay metal. Yep. <laughs> well, that, you know, that, that's not even me. It's uh, it's just thanks a lot. Like they signed it uh, to someone else, I think, mm. but I'm not sure because it's kind of rubbed off with time. But I don't know, you know, I don't. Well, let's put it this way: <laughs> I got this for a fraction of what it normally sells for. So I got I'm, that not, yeah, the... I'm really hoping those first two albums will get re- re- reissued. Yeah. I, hey, Craig, I got how you doing? On, I got that on CD on Halloween Day, 1993, at the used CD store. I've never even seen it on CD. Oh, I which remember. one? San- Sandy Obscure, I have it on CD, but I'm talking yeah, about Extraction from Oh, Mortality. yeah, yeah, the Sandy Obscure. Yeah, because yeah, I remember we were, uh, yeah, we were decorating for Halloween, and I took a break and walked down to the record store, and they had gotten them a bunch of decent stuff in, and that was one of them I picked up and then took it back and played it the rest of the afternoon while we were decorating the dorm for uh, Halloween. Dude, I was skeptical about them, too, because it's such a singularly bad, bad na- band name, I think, Believer. I mean, yeah, I could think of worse things, but, like, when you're saying as far as one to sort of, you know, bring people in or someone else at a gateway, I mean, it, that's a hard name to get past. You know what I mean? It's not, it, it doesn't have any of that ambi- ambiguity that even like a Messiah prophet does. You know what I mean? Like Emerald, you know, that's a really easy one. Yeah. You know, it, it's be, no mortification. Yeah, I'll give you that. <laughs> yeah, mortification. That's the easy one. But Believer, you know, but, but they're, I swear they're one of the best. There was also a single that was released with that album. Huh. I've never seen that. Oh, cool. And the single was released. It was a Roadrunner thing, but they were sending it to radio stations and it's got an anti-drug PSA on it. So there, it was a PSA and a way to promote the album. Drugs are bad, okay? <laughs> yep. <laughs> Don't do drugs or you'll sound like us. <laughs> All right, Scott, you're up next. All right. I got this pile of crap. I know where to put it. Um, I kind of have these in order from like old stuff to newer stuff. So um, earlier he was talking about the Swedish scene. Oh, I think that was before it went live. But yeah, I've always been. It's like this. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of fascinated with the fact that there were so many Christian bands from Sweden. Oh, yeah, but, it is. but, you know, it seems like all the bands were American or Swedish. And given that Sweden has so many fewer people than, you know, the Netherlands or Germany or Britain or so many other places, it just seems odd that there would be this concentration there, you know? Yeah. And this, this is one of those bands this is leviticus this is their first full-length album that an ep before this one that came out in 79 80 i think this is early 80s as well um this is actually an or- original pressing i there was a, i have a repressing of it too but um jag skull segra this one's actually sung in in swedish and then there whoops there's their first u.s release i shall conquer which is actually the same as jal sag segra it's just english lyrics and re-recorded this version is better because it's a little more raw this one's a little more polished and then this is uh the strongest power these guys sounded swedish but they also kind of had a new wave of british heavy metal sound about them um like they would have fit perfectly in with that whole new wave of british heavy metal movement in my opinion you've heard them right aaron Dude, dude you know what they're like they're like a new wave of british heavy metal band with just a little touch of that swedish magic Exactly. So there, it's true. He's, he's, they're really good. Um, then after that, they started going more commercial. And I still have those albums. But those first three right there, I think they're just, I really like them. They're just so raw and very European <laughs> sounding. Great stuff. And all of them have recently been, re- been reissued on CD and vinyl. So they're really easy. Even the, even the Swedish ones. So they're really easy to find right now. Someone asked, is there stoner metal Christian music? I would say Black Sabbath. <laughs> yeah. Trouble tons would count it. for the Doom side, and they kind of got of into the stoner vibe. Tons later. of it. I, can, yeah. I, have, I pulled a few Doom albums to show, so. Well, there we go. All right. Alan, or I'm sorry, Aaron, you're up next. Oh, am I? Shit. Well, actually, here, I, um, 
I, I actually pulled this uh, while you were talking about it oh, right to, to get Scott going on this. Because I actually don't know anything about this band, but he just referenced it, and I had it uh, nearby. So this is Malachi. Take it away, Scott. That album it's sells. Like the cover is awesome. Until recently, up until recently, if you could find a copy of that album, it sold for at least $500, if not more. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's an expensive one. It's actually a really good album. It's it's like Queen's Reiki, but it's like the EP Queen's Reiki. You know what I mean? It's it's straight up heavy metal. Uh, I always like the cover art. It's it's ridiculous, but it's cool at the same time. <laughs> um, but in any case, they uh, they put that out. Then they got signed to a label, and they put out a, a new album called Red Sunrise. And they had a keyboard player who took over a lot of the sound of the band, and it got more polished. And yeah, look at that look. <laughs> It's awesome. I love it. <laughs> um, I know people think it's cheesy these days the way this band's dressed, but man, they were putting on a show. It was larger than life. They weren't. They weren't getting up on stage and staring at their sneakers. You know. I, anyhow, but yeah, it's a it's a really really good album. And it's been reissued, so the price has come down quite a bit. The reissue is only like twenty five twenty twenty five bucks, and even the and if you, the originals are still ridiculous, if you can even find one, even the cassette tapes are sell for a uh, hundred bucks or more. Yeah. And here's the reason. Here's the reason why. After the band got signed to the lab, to the label and released Red Sunrise, they had piles of those records in a dumpster. They didn't think anybody wanted them. And then they they saved a few cartons of them. And then in the '90s, when records were kind of nobody cared about them, they threw the rest in a dumpster. So they're just you wow. just can't find them. There's none available. Not even the band has any copies. Yeah. All right. I was I was lucky enough that I found somebody who had one copy that I was able to redo that cover art for. Otherwise, I would have had to redo it from the cassette, and that would have that would have sucked. sucked. <laughs> yeah. Good luck. That's yeah. where you see how good you are. Can mm -hmm. you do it? Yeah. I <laughs> have. I have <laughs> this reissue, just for anyone who's like tempted, this thing is beautiful. I mean, you know, this is rocks, and uh, they the you know they do nice work over there, but. Uh, this is definitely an outstanding one. For the for the record, Rocks Records and No Life to Metal Records are the same company. Um, it's just that No Life to Metal is um, non Christian music, and Rocks Records is strictly Christian metal. It's like oh. subdivisions, subdivisions of the same. Yeah, that's yeah. All. yeah, yeah, same same owner basically. Um, yeah, so yeah, it's Bill Baffert who's the own who owns them both, and I'm his partner in both. Right on. All right. Alan. All right. Uh, since we're showing some, yeah, the more obscure uh, independent ones, we were talking about this one in the dugout. I think a lot of us pulled it. Um, so I'll, I'll just go ahead and break the seal on Emerald. Uh, California band. They did, you know, this one kind of mini album, EP, whatever you want to call it, uh, Armed is. for Battle. And it is a fantastic heavy metal record. You know, this is one that doesn't matter what they're singing about, you know, musically great stuff, traditional heavy metal. Some of the tracks have a little bit of a doomy heaviness to them. There's literally one called winds of doom. Uh, mm -hmm. Very good vocalist, good, clean sound, uh, just a very heavy release. And this is one that, yeah, not quite as bad as the uh, Malachi that Aaron just showed, but this has always been one that's been hard to find. And is that an original presser? This is an original pressing. Looks yep. like it. Yeah. Yep. We're, we're all showing them here, and people are watching are going to be like, oh, we got to be able to find that. Everybody's got one. <laughs> well, you can yeah, find it because it's been repressed. So, yeah. yeah. This has been repressed. They, uh, the band actually put out some vinyl this year with, uh, it's called a Demo 1984. Although yep. poking around online, it's not really clear if the, uh, the tracks were used as bonus material on some reissues. I don't know if they actually released the demo back in 1984 uh, or it was just songs that only saw the light of day much much later but yeah emerald for a short period of time this was the top item on my want list uh, i looked and looked and looked for this and finally uh got a hold of a copy but it, it was good enough that yeah it sat there at the top of the want list for a while a excellent stuff for 1987 like y'all mentioned earlier sometimes christian bands are slightly behind the curve in terms of what's most popular by 87 you know, you already have death metal starting up, thrash metal's at its prime. You know, this is just, you know, prime traditional heavy metal. You know, this would have, if you listen to it, you'd think it was maybe came out in like 1984, 
rather than 87. They were a little, little dated sounding maybe for 87, but the music's so good. It doesn't matter. Uh, doesn't matter when it came out. It's an excellent release. So yeah, I would definitely recommend Emerald to anybody that just wants you know, a really good album. Excellent heavy metal. You know, the Christian messaging is there, but it's not one that's going to you know, beat you over the head or get in the way of just excellent heavy metal music at all. So I can tell you a little fact about that album that most people don't know. And the, if you look on the back cover of the album, there's a picture of the band. The bass player is the, um, on the, I believe on the far left-hand side. Let's and see. he, um, I think he's, the, I think he's an Oriental looking guy. Yeah. That's Hold him on. right there. He, blow you up. he didn't actually, he's not actually the bass player who played on the album. Oh, really? He joined afterwards. He joined, yeah, right at the end. The bass player on that album was actually uh, Roger Dale Martin, who left the band to help form Vengeance Rising. Oh, well, that, okay. that makes sense, though, because that's how the come he's in this picture that they took at a live show they were actually playing. <laughs> Larry's looking like a badass. <laughs> yeah, this is just the insert that came with it, so more pictures of the guys. Larry is going to jump out of his eye rock and beat some ass. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always amazed at the number of bands that have personnel changes right when they're in the middle of releasing or recording something. You see that so often in <laughs> heavy metal. It's just like one of the guys credited or pictured either just joined the band or got kicked out halfway through the recording. He's either on the album, but not in the band or he's in the band, but not on the album. They weren't cutting it in the studio probably. And that was, you know, yep. time is money. And if you're sucking in the studio, it's mm -hmm. bye. -bye. Yeah, but uh, yeah, yeah. I, speak despite, with, I, uh, can, I can speak with experience about that one. Yeah, but yeah, that uh, yeah, Emerald's right at the top of the heap for you know top-notch Christian metal releases for me. All right, so I'll just leave this while I pass it over to you, Marty. You, you know what's funny? Real quick about that Emerald record. Oh, sure, go ahead. Aaron. I told this story in a video before. I got that record because I I was still living in LA at the time actually, and, came, and someone had one, and they wanted way more for it than I was willing to spend for it. But um, they wanted they were interested in trading and they were looking for soundtracks. I had a bunch of shit I just gotten for like nothing, like at shops around LA. Damn it, Craig! This guy, a bunch of soundtracks. I didn't give a crap about getting the Emerald Records. So now every time I like hear people in videos or whatever, like Mister Bizarro and shit, he'll be like talking about these soundtrack records. I'll think, oh yeah, soundtracks. I used to have soundtrack records, but I traded <laughs> that Emerald record. <laughs> you know, kind of makes me feel good. Like, yeah, I did the right thing. <laughs> Mm -hmm. thanks craig we appreciate you man thank you craig, so much you're much too kind man much too kind we'll get you back on soon cheers yes we've already well we've already we've got a tentative date with craig we're waiting to see if one other guest can join us uh for that show right so on it's in the works in the works i'm, I'm working on it <laughs> right on no you've been awesome thanks fat um guy in a, fat guy in a shirtless vest is always a good look <laughs> <laughs> um First, yep <laughs> Well, this band I didn't realize was even a Christian band until some years later after buying this record. And the cool thing is there was a record show here in Traverse City, which is not rare, but they're usually not good. Some guy came up from downstate, set up a table, had a bunch of cool metal stuff. I got this original Brutal Records pressing for 15 bucks in really good shape by Incubus, Serpent Temptation. Oh, yeah. Someone just mentioned that in the... Uh, yeah, the, I saw people clamoring for it, so I figured I'm, I had it in my stack. I might as well move it to the front, but a um, uh, couple brothers. Yep. Uh, Moses Howard and Francis Howard. Guitars and drums. Power Trio. These guys ended up, of course, getting problems with their name because the more popular shitty in Incubus, I think, yep. uh, gave them a cease and desist. Even though these guys were way before them. <laughs> Yeah. Um, there's also a new wave of British heavy metal incubus way before them. True that for yep. another night. <laughs> and, um, they ended up changing their name to opprobrium, but, uh, yeah, this is really good thrash. This is kind of like proto death. It's thrashy, but mm -hmm. there's a little bit of death metal going on here. And these guys are always really killer. And I never in a million years knew these guys are Christian until I heard about it one day. And I looked at the cover and went, duh. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's kind of obvious. I mean, thanks, Mr. Obvious. I guess just didn't really ever pay attention, but um, I did the same thing, man. Yeah. Killer record. Mm -hmm. They had an album after this. I can't remember the name of it. I don't own it. The unknown, maybe? So yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, yeah, I, I had that one. Actually. It's got the yeah. Reaper on the cover, yep. bluish. Yeah, yeah. Bluish, more of a bluish color. Yeah, it's yeah, it was a decent album too. This album and that album were both reissued, I think, by Relapse, and they were under the name Opprobrium. So you know what opprobrium is a bad band name? Because when you say that word, 
it sounds like what Europeans think Americans sound like. <laughs> I thought you were just going to say it's not appropriate. <laughs> I think it's, yeah. Uh, See, it's a good word, like, that was a dad joke right there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was. There will probably be more. He is the grim overlord of bad jokes, and we love him. All right. You're up, Scott. They, they fooled oh. Zoller, too. There you go. <laughs> I'm going to show um, the next one I'm going to show is a new wave of British heavy metal one. It's not the album I want to show. I wish I had their first album. Uh, it's been on my want list forever and I don't own it. But this is um, 100% proof. They were oh. an early 80s band out of UK, part of that whole new wave of British heavy metal movement. They released mm -hmm. a single, which I'm also trying to find desperately. Uh, and then their first album, which I don't own either. This is their second album called Power and the Power and the Glory. But it's just, I mean, it's exactly what you'd expect from, you know, Thing, new wave of british heavy metal is not really a sound either because i mean you got venom and raven and tank and all those bands who are really heavy then you've got you know bands like def leopard that were much more commercial these guys fall somewhere closer to the um like late later De tigers of pan tang kind of sound as mm -hmm. opposed to the venoms or, or ravens but i still really dig them and if anybody ever finds that first album for me I'd appreciate it. <laughs> I just yeah. can't find one for at, at, at all. There is a copy of the single on, on eBay that's been sitting there for three years that I keep watching, but he won't drop his price and he wants $80 for it. I'm just not paying $80 for a single. Yeah. It's a so, rare yeah. single, but yeah, it's that's that seems high to me for it as well. If he's sitting on it for three years, that ought to tell him something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah it's, it's still there. So, yep. Yeah, I hadn't thought there of that band in that forever. Was a quick that's, one. A, that's a good one, Scott. I hadn't thought of that band in ages. Okay. Aaron, I'm going to go use a little boys room while you guys talk amongst yourselves. I'll be right back. All right. Well, shit. You know something? I'll just go ahead and bust this one out. Absolutely. Yeah. There you go. Yep. Talk, talking of heavy hitters from the independent uh, kind of scene. Yeah. This is, uh, you know something? This record is why my collection is private on Discogs. Yeah, I don't doubt Because it. I got sick of people messaging me asking if I was willing to part with it. Because I'm not, and I hate saying no to people all the time. <laughs> but this is like, this is just such an all-time favorite. And there's so much you could rip on about this record. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's yeah. kind of has an AOR sensibility. There's uh, some kind of corny sound effects. It's like very preachy in places. Like it has some of the cheesy courses. But the way everything comes together is just absolute perfection the songs are so good like what it lacks in production it actually makes up for in production by having this weird sort of hazy sound that kind of makes it sound um even more like it's from another planet than it already does just on the strength of the songwriting i was gonna say ethereal yeah ethereal is a good word for it but but that but ethereal almost doesn't sound heavy enough you know what i mean yeah it's not the heaviest record ever but ethereal almost makes it sound like there's just no bottom end to it. And this thing has enough of that. You know what I mean? It still rocks, you know, and it has great hooks, you know, it's like the little, it's like, it's almost too much so many times, but there's just a hard record that's to like, listen to and just not feel good, man. Just it's, it's great. Just every song is awesome. And they have a you second one now too, right? You have, you have the EP, right? Which is, I don't have the EP. Really? Why don't you get it? I mean, I, yeah, why, Aaron? Why well, don't you well, I have the reissue. I don't have the original. Why not? Oh, Everybody's it has to be the original. I mean, the, the, the reissue is fantastic. It sounds really good. Plus, it has their 78 um, demo on it. 100%. 100%. I completely agree. If you don't have this and that EP and you're watching this, I swear, you better go get it before they both dry up. If you can only get one, then grab the one that you can grab because the EP is just as good. Yeah. And, and for folks that aren't aware, yeah, the EP we're referencing EP, is, is one EP. of those like thousand dollar type items for an yeah. original press. It's insane. I'll grab it really. Here, talk for a sec. I'll just grab it. Yeah. Go the ahead. Re, yeah. The reissue is really well done. They did a great mm -hmm. job with it. Um, I, I didn't work on it. I did get to do the album. I did get to scan the covers for both of the reissues because nobody had them. So they hired me to do this to re restore the covers um oh, okay. so that was kind of fun being able to do the messiah covers mm -hmm. but it That's wasn't cool. for one of the labels i usually work for so mm -hmm. 
yeah but yeah but yeah anyhow. the album that aaron showed is very very rare the the e the original ep is i know a little secret off. about that band as well that most people don't know they recorded a third album that was never released I think I've heard that somewhere before, but yeah, I've never heard the album, but I think I remember that. Yeah. They had some unreleased stuff. Yep. That's the, that's the reissue right there. Uh, the, that's the EP. Yeah. Is that the original? Just add oh, that's the, I can tell it's the reissue because the reissue is the only difference between the front cover of the reissue and the, the original is that stupid little white line underneath of the shadow right there. See the shadow from the ball. Oh yeah. Right there. Yep. It was supposed to bleed off the edge and they didn't bleed it. Oh. That's and only somebody, only a stupid graphic designer like me would notice something like that. But I'll hold it like this. There you go. Perfect. Now it's perfect. <laughs> hey, listen. It really, it really irritated me when it came in the mail, and I was like, "Ah, oh, come on." <laughs> yeah, you've, um, you've already uh, you've already sold one Messiah to uh, Zoller tonight. Aaron. Yeah, Zoller just went and bought a, a, a Messiah record. Here's here's the thing about this record, okay? Now this is was originally a four track EP, and what I'm holding in my hands is uh, an eight track LP, okay? Now normally I'm very, I'm pretty hostile towards bonus tracks, okay? But this is totally an exception. These extra songs are great. The whole thing flows as if it were an album. It's not like it's just a bunch of alternate takes of the same song or something like that. The two songs on this that are the same as on the album were actually, um, they're, they're different versions, but uh, they were actually on the original EP. Everything on here is, uh, well, there are a couple songs that are on the album again, too. This has Lucifer and Final Warning off the demo from 79 that Scott mentioned earlier. But this thing's totally worth it, too, so... Don't don't like look at it and go. Oh, it has all these bonus tracks, and bonus tracks generally suck. They do, but not on that record. You're the only person I know of that hates the bonus tracks on stuff. <laughs> I always like, oh, cool, it's got bonus tracks. <laughs> That's what I used to do, but then I had like hundreds of albums where the bonus tracks were crap, and and like and of like the ones where they weren't all crap, it would still like kind of mess with the arc of the album. You know. <clears throat> all right, Alan. All right, uh, let me check one little thing. Holy here. shit, Tom just checked. There's an OG copy of that on Discogs right now going well, for $1,500. Yeah. Not... Hang on, someone's asking $1,500. They're bucks. not going to get that. No way. No. For that original EP, somebody, 1500 is not that out of the question for that original EP. I would saw my penis off and feed it to a dog before I paid 1500 bucks for a single. <laughs> that is specific <laughs> and vivid at the same time and has nothing to do with buying a record. <laughs> <laughs> but uh but, but no, you know it, that, i know it sounds crazy but no for an original copy of that ep uh yeah. you're not going to touch it for under a thousand bucks unless you just you know stumble into you know that you know once in a lifetime kind of flea market find it's it's a it's a it's a thousand dollar plus item it just is if it bleeds so. we can crop it <laughs> oh that's a good one <laughs> all Sorry. right uh, chat chat's on fire tonight cheers everybody yes folks are having fun and i'm glad to see it so let's talk about a little band from chicago not that one somebody will talk about them later uh, i'm talking about a band called commandment and they had a very good traditional galloping heavy metal style barring you from the classics of maiden and priest and such they only got they recorded a bunch of music, but they only got one actual product out back in the 80s. Uh, it was a seven inch single and it was released on a label called Amethyst Records, which I think is stationed here in South Carolina, where uh, I'm at. Funny thing about the label, it was sort of a tax shelter kind of thing. The folks that ran it were just yeah looking for ways to move money around and stuff. But they ended up with a few different heavy metal singles released. Uh, the band Carnage did one, and this you know, Christian metal band from Chicago somehow ended up on the label for uh, the single. It's got Engraved in Stone and Oriental Maiden on it, and really good stuff. Yeah, again, if you just like you know your you know sort of up tempo traditional heavy metal from the first half of the '80s, this is an excellent slab of it. There's some funny you know things with the band. The single, for reasons I cannot explain, there's a different version of the single. Again, this was a cheapo label. They were just looking for ways to, you know, to, you know, write off money and make it disappear. But they actually put out some copies with a black label instead of the silver label. Uh, the black one is much, much rarer. I don't know if it came first or second. I have no idea why there's two different label versions of the single. It's the same music. But just what's different this, labels. Uh, regardless, what's, it's really good. 
What's the, the song band called? had recorded a bunch of stuff, but it didn't get released until much later. Uh, OPM Records put out uh, their 88 recordings as engraved in stone. I think this came out on a OPM in 1999, the first time around. Um, let's see. Here's the guys in the band. Yeah, And again, very solid album. It also got released later on. <coughs> Excuse me. It got a, Now, OPM never did CDs. So it got a CD release years later on the uh, Greek label Arcane Steel, who always did a really good job of digging up these... 80s and 90s US obscurities that had only maybe had like a cassette release or something back in the day. So, yeah, uh, Commandment, you can also get it on CD, no problem. And they also recorded another album's worth of stuff in 89 that came out under the name No Mercy. And that album's also fairly good and also available through Arcane Steel. So, yeah, it's kind of funny. They recorded a bunch of stuff. Just I guess they didn't get label interest, or I don't know if the band had fallen apart and just nobody pursued it at the time. Scott, you might know, but yeah, you can get two different versions of the single, and then you can get you know two full albums worth of material that just didn't see the what's light the of day for a couple of decades. What's the A side of that single called? Uh, let's see. You've got engraved in stone on one side, and Oriental Maiden on the other side. Cool. You had one I don't didn't know, so I just wrote it down. Now I'm gonna oh, look for okay. it. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. I'm pretty sure both songs are on the album. I'm no Oriental Maiden is. I'm checking to see. Yeah, but I'm a, I, have, I love seven inch singles. I'm always looking for them. So I, I think cool. that 45 might turn out more than that album now, too. Hey, you want to know a fun fact about that LP? Absolutely I do. So you know the um <clears throat> you know the death metal sampler on noise, the early one, the classic one? Yep, yep. Mm-hmm. The guy who sold me my copy for 20 bucks is the guy who painted that cover for the commandment record. Oh, really? Goofy. For OPM, yeah. Okay. 20 bucks? God. This is 20 years ago. But I sort of met him in the early days of eBay. I bought a ton of shit from him, and I was looking for that one. He said he thought he had it, but he couldn't find it. Mm -hmm. And he turned it up, and it was like 20 bucks. Very nice. But uh, yeah, and you're right, Aaron. Yeah, the, uh, the OPM press of commandment is now... It's not super, I mean, it's not Messiah type money, but it's probably going to run you $50 or more if you find it. So the, a lot of those OPM ones have dried up over time too. Yeah. For, for a reissue of something like that, that's a pretty expensive record as based on the last time I looked. So, yep. Yeah. But yeah, they did. I uh, like searched for it. I haven't like, you know, I could probably find a deal if I would like applied my methods. <laughs> If you wanted to really work at it, you might could uh, dredge one up, but uh, it, it does take a little, yeah, you got to kind of roll up the sleeves. You're absolutely right. All right, Marty, what you got on your stack next? Well, I'm uh, I'm the Captain Obvious in this uh, little discussion tonight, and i got to show this band first before I can show the other things I want to talk about, so mortification. Absolutely. We got the, um, the self-titled debut and Scrolls in the Megaloth. These are the OG presses, I believe. Yeah, Intense Records. Um, yep, that that album, I have. That's I don't own it, but that's the last one of theirs I like. I remember when they're on Metal Blade for a hot minute. I was getting promos from the label for that, and Steve just got into this. He had a killer death metal voice, and he let it go for more of a hardcore shouting style. Some people dug it. Yep. I just I couldn't I couldn't go where he wanted to go. I couldn't. And um, fun fact, a um, religious group brought them in the band Killed by Kane here to Traverse City, which if any of you knew where Traverse City was, it's kind of amazing because we're way up the hell. We're about six hours north of Chicago, five hours north of Detroit. I mean, we're up. We're up here. They played at uh, um, Lars Hoxie Auditorium, which is a, a theater and a school here in town. There was maybe 20 or 50 people there, maybe. It was a huge hall. And there was hardly – having a big, humongous theater and then only having a handful of people, it, it, you couldn't. It was kind of pathetic. But Killed by Kane, I wasn't much into, but you know, Mortification were great. And um, these guys were – the thing that really, really is a bummer about both these records, the music are really cool. The sound is rough. The guitar tone – their guitar tone does not have a lot of balls – if they had a little bit better production, I think these the songs would really jump better. But I mean, still, they're great, great death metal records for sure. Steve's vocals are amazing. Uh, the reason I'm showing this, 
for the next couple I've got here is uh, their drummer, Jason Sherlock, who has gone on to be in a whole bunch of bands after his departure from Mortification. But um, this is a strong beginning for this band for sure. And Scott, I'm sure, can elaborate much more on this band than I can because he's worked with the band doing... Um, yeah, they're on Nuclear Blast. Then uh, Nuclear Blast reissued this, uh, re-released um, Scrolls of the Megaloth as well. Yeah, this was uh, Mortification, Benediction, Gorefist, and Macabre. Yep. Uh, anyhow. Very cool 7-inch. All right. And yet, actually, you're back, Scott. Well, I was going to show those two, but, but since you showed them, I'm not going to worry about it. But I will quickly show this, and I'll show what I was something else. But this is Light Force. Again, this is an yep. album a lot of people hate. Never I heard it. I've album. always been curious. I've always been curious. I love this album. This is a bit late, but this sounds, if you like the typical new wave or British heavy metal sound, um, like Tank, early Iron Maiden, you know, Diano era Iron Maiden, um, even like Girl School and, you know, that kind of punk meets heavy metal sound that a lot of those bands had in, in, in the early 80s. That's what you get with this. Very influenced by, you can tell he's a huge Steve Harris fan on this thing, but it's very influenced by that sound. And it's this is this is Mortification before they change their name to Mortification. So uh. Uh, basically the first album um, called Break the Curse was um, that came out, I think Nuclear Blast released it as well, Break the Curse, um, was out under the Light Force name and then it got re-released under the mortification name. So um, they changed their sound. They went from this, their next, the next stuff they recorded was thrash. Then they started doing the death metal thing on the break the curse. And that's kind of where they got signed to intense records. Uh, Roger Martinez from vengeance rising produced that mortif that first mortification album. Um, and then they got picked up by uh, nuclear blast. And then later on by metal blade. Right on. So, anyhow, was that the pure metal one that you just had there? What was that? The pure metal one? That was yes. an original you just had there, wasn't it? Yeah, just the original. Right on. Yeah, I have the reissue. I thought you were going to pull it out. I would. I would yeah. add too that it has like a. I think the early Iron Maiden is a good touchstone, but like they don't really sound like Maiden though. But the only thing I think is with the um, – I feel like they have a more sort of fully realized metal sound than what you hear on some of the bands that I think of as embodying that new wave of British heavy metal sound. You know what I mean? Like Maiden has it, but I feel like they sound more sort of classically metal than, say, Tank that has a little bit more of that motorhead vibe going on. Maybe that's just, just – that. uh, that, That's not even a good example. I'm just trying – I'm just thinking there's, there's a sort of barroom quality that a lot of those bands have that I don't hear in Light Horse. So, yeah, oh, yeah, it's a really, but I like that record a lot. And it's been reissued. It's been reissued. Um, by the way, a lot of these ones we're talking about, you can get them from even the Messiah records you guys are looking for. You can get them for a decent price over at um, boonsoverstock.com. So, um, anyhow, this is my next next one, and I grabbed two of their albums. They have, oops, they have three albums out. I got a sheet on the front, but this is this is a test pressing. That's why. Um, let me pull it out of this thing so you can actually see the cover. But this is Haven, band out of Pennsylvania. Um, a little bit, a little bit late for the style that they do. I, I kind of describe them as um, King Diamond um, meets. Gosh, who was the other band I was thinking of? Queen, King Diamond meets early Queensrÿche. Um, so he's got that huge vocal style like Jeff Tate with all that big vibrato singing kind of style, but the music is very kind of creepy very much in the in the early uh, merciful fate king diamond style um i really like this band a lot and they're pretty pretty unknown they've got three albums out i just pulled the first two um i wouldn't buy the third album if you never heard of it before i either one of these if you're going to check up check this band out i would check these out first the first album is called your dying day second album is called age of darkness they're both great um third album was just called three um but it's not as good as these first two so that's why i wouldn't recommend going with that one first but yeah just great great straight 80s heavy metal kind of haunting stuff but i kind of dig it um this one came out in 1990 this one came out in 1991 so like i said a little late for the for the style of music but it's really good for what is do you have those aaron I really like all three of those, I was going to say. I have the reissues of all three. I don't have original. I mean, it's not like all these other bands. I didn't pull those because you put me on to them. What am I going to tell you about them, you know? 
<laughs> but um, yeah, I think we agree, but the first one is definitely the best. I don't know. I, I like the first one a lot, and I would I used to say that, but I kind of like the second one a little bit more because it's a little more creepy and haunting, and I kind of dig that sound. It's got those weird – they do them weird cores, and they had that weird clean guitar stuff here and there. And I, I don't know. This one kind of has more of that King Diamond thing going on for some reason. Yeah, not that they I'm were trying to – not that they were trying to copy Mr. Flitter King Diamond. I, I, I'd never heard any of them even mention those, but that's just what it reminds me of. Yeah. Yeah, I would have thought of King Diamond immediately. I mean, I, I get what you're saying for sure, but it's not like, I mean, it feels like the mesmerist or something. It really kind of sounds like he's going for that. You know, Haven doesn't do anything like that for me. That's more sort of the package. Yeah, yeah, totally. Man. I'm going to pull, I'm going to listen to that after we adjourn, actually. So. <laughs> Yeah, the, none of those were available on um, vinyl up until recently. They were all released on CD and cassette because it was 1990 and vinyl was going by the wayside at the time. So they've all been recent. I think 2017, they were all reissued from, I don't know, was it Bombworks or maybe Retroactive? I could just look on the record. Yeah. Retroactive. <laughs> okay. Aaron, you're up. Oh, shit. Okay. Oh, what the hell, man? Someone's asked about this before. So this is one that I actually found at Amoeba Hollywood. Oh, uh, yeah. Nice. I got that one too. Uh, and this yeah. is kind of a more fun one to show, and it's kind of a cooler piece because it has all these cool little things like that font that they chose for their song titles. <laughs> but you know something? Even though generally speaking, <laughs> I tend to like sort of like a stripped-down garage band sound, the songs on this, on the album, I think sound better. The sound is fatter. There's just sort of more meat to it. And I just kind of think overall it's better. It's just, a, And I also feel like the songs, this is a lot of the same songs on that. Um, and the worst songs are kind of on all on here. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I don't know if I'd really recommend this over uh, some things, but it's definitely a cool piece. Um yeah, I'm glad to have found it in the wild. And it's a band that I mean a lot of people know. So there we go. Yeah, look at the look at that. I always thought that was the corniest picture in the world, but I actually kind of love it. Dude, like, the, yeah. Where is the, the with the cross acoustic guitars and he's got the acoustic V? The flying V acoustic <laughs> guitar means fucking business, let me tell you. Has anyone <laughs> ever seen an acoustic flying V outside of that specific picture? Because I, I have. never have. And they play, he plays it on stage. I never have, but I think it's kind of cool. <laughs> it's kind of cool, but kind of corny at the same time. <laughs> All right. Alan, you are up next, sir. Okay. Sorry, just one second. Just oh, that's okay. To, uh, yeah, Craig in the chat over here. Yeah, chat's very lively tonight. It's good to see you, as always. Uh, let's see. Next one. A few things tonight I want to have to show pictures of because a lot of the Christian metal albums I had. We're on cassette, like I said back in the day. And when I purged out all my cassettes, I didn't replace everything with a hard copy. So some of the stuff I only have on digital. But some of the albums are definitely worth talking about. And this one came up in the chat a little bit earlier. It's a band called Bride. And this is their third or fourth album called Snakes in the Playground. It came out in 92. Their first few albums, I think, were on Intense Records, which, of course, put out a lot of Christian uh, heavy metal, but this one was on Star Song, which is a label I'm not familiar with. Don't think I ever found anything else that was on Star Song. Is that uh, Baron Bride Cross on Star Song? I'm sorry, what? Isn't yeah, that Baron first, Cross album on Star Song? That first Baron Cross album on Star Song, and it was a that was a huge label. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Just one I guess I didn't cross paths with for whatever reason, but uh, yeah, the Bright album uh, was an interesting one. It's got. Uh, it leans more like the ACDC direction of heaviness, you know, very power chordy. Uh, it's got a bit of a Southern hard rock vibe mixed into it, which, yep, there it is. You know, so it was perfect for, you know, me and my friends, you know, being, you know, in the South, you know, it was a, a sound that really appealed to us. Uh, it's a very loud kind of sound. The story you told earlier, Scott, about having issues with gigs. I remember reading a couple of interviews with guys from Bride. And they had the exact same experiences. They would sign up to play, you know, these, you know, Christian music festivals. And they would explain, it's like, look, we got a lot of big amplifiers. We're going to be very loud. Is this cool? And, you know, the people organized and be like, oh, of course, praise be. You know, and they'd get up there and they'd start playing these big, heavy power chords. And people literally just be, you know, they describe it as just 
grabbing their sandwiches and running away. <laughs> and they're like, well, this isn't working quite right. <laughs> so yeah, you know, they had a very hard and heavy sound. Some folks might think of them as more metal adjacent as compared to, you know, a lot of the heavy metal we listen to, but a good band nonetheless. They also, I noticed, you know, would put a little more bite into some of their lyrics, you know, not in terms of being more preachy, but just coming up with maybe more inventive ways to say things. I don't remember which song it is off this album, but, um, you know, there's one song where they're kind of you know, making a point about abortion, and we're not going to go into political issues or hear anything, folks, but, you know, the lyric they chose, you know, it wasn't something like, Jesus loves the little children. The lyrical line on it, of which I will always remember, is uh, Coat Hanger Alley, where the doctors work cheap. <laughs> and just like, fuck, that's pretty damn heavy for, you know... <laughs> Uh, uh, something you know, that I bought at the Christian bookstore. <laughs> so like, I can't even believe I'm laughing at that. <laughs> it's like, okay, that's a that, that's a thing right there. So, uh, yeah, yeah, th this was a band you know, that was kind of you know pretty loud and you know, in your face about some things, but you know coming up you know, with a way to say it that you you would notice whether you agreed with them or not. So I know they did a bunch more albums as well. Um, that was their, I heard maybe one or two, but that was you know, this was album. the one that was in my you know circle of friends. Uh, so this is always the one I think back on when I hear the name Bride. And that was that was the first album where they changed their sound. It was their fifth or sixth album. And mm. if you were they that, different on the earlier stuff? Yes, their first album was just pure straight up heavy metal, which I really love. Their second album was almost a speed metal version of the first album, and I really like that album. Um, mm. And then the third album they changed a little bit more um they were obviously being influenced a bit by aerosmith and some of the sleazy stuff going on in, in la i definitely heard aerosmith then by that album they were totally taking on the whole aerosmith guns and roses vibe mm -hmm. so but if you're looking for that vinyl it was re recently reissued um on vinyl for the first time and girder girdermusic.com has copies but not many left Okay. Yeah, well, I saw something just, recently about it getting a, a new press. And I was like, show, oh, yeah. I showed that. I, wasn't, I didn't even pull that. I just pulled it now. There's actually this thing going on, too. Um, so this is, the, this is the Snakes in the Playground album that you're talking about. This is the Snake in the Playground, quote, demos album. Um, oh, neat. Which is really good. I like it actually better than this one. <laughs> huh. because here's, so here's the deal. They, they, they were signed with Star Song. Um, which is a which was a major label back in the day, still is. It's owned by Capital Music, um, but uh, they recorded the entire album, this one here, in a studio before they had a producer and a big label and everything like that. So they took that album that was finished to the to the label and said, "Here's our album," and they said, "Oh, good, we love it. Okay, let's go in the studio and record." Um. And they were like, "Wait a minute, we've already got the album recorded," and they're like, "Uh." -uh. We're gonna we're gonna so they brought in a big name producer and they redid the whole album and this is what became of it. So okay, this album's got some that. of the same songs that are way different. It's got some songs that didn't make the cut. So it's mm -hmm. it's really they're really cool. And the fun thing about this one is, and I'm gonna brag because I got to design the album cover for this one and they want it to be similar. That's why they look like this. Yeah. So there's this kid hold there's this kid holding the little toys here. This is my granddaughter holding the toys here. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my uh, my daughter in law is a photographer, so I said I need the picture of my of your of your daughter, you know, holding these toys similar to this, and she took it. And so there you go, the two albums together. Sorry, I keep interrupting everybody else's. No, that's things. good. Oh no, no, you got more. That's why we do. I knew when I said, perfect. why don't we do this? It would be a good topic because mm -hmm. you, you you know it for sure. That was Alan. I'm gonna go next. Um, yep, your turn, Marty. These are two albums that came out the same year and involved the same guy. Um, this first one we're going to talk about, we've already talked about in uh, an episode of the Heavy Metallurgy Album Club. It's um, Paramecium's Exhumed of Earth. Oh, of the yeah. Earth. I knew you'd pull this, so I did not. It, it's awesome. This is such a great record. I mean, this would be, if this was on the shelf in the Rainbow Bookstore, it would have said, if you like My Dying Bride, check out you know, uh, Paramecium, <laughs> even though yep. you know, the Christian bookstore probably wouldn't have known who My Dying Bride is. But um this album rules and it's just amazing atmospheric doom uh they got a little violin in there it, it kind of shows that uh jason sherlock isn't messing around i mean he he is a great musician a great songwriter and he the same year this album came out as well a little bit of a controversial record hordes helig usvart 
which is wholly unblack and I'm assuming Norwegian. I don't know. Um, it was obviously the, the, the style he was going for because he nailed it. He nailed it. The sound, the riffs, the screaming, the whole damn thing. He nailed it, the, the vibe of Norwegian black metal on this. Uh, Dark Throne in particular, but if you put this up against Transylvanian Hunger, some people are going to hurl garbage at me for saying this. This album crushes Transylvanian Hunger. The riffs are really strong. The songwriting is really good. Um, the he, drumming is insane. The drumming is very insane. He's an amazing drummer. But he, he does everything particularly well. Um, you know, you, you you read, you know, Invert the Inverted Cross, Weak, Feeble, <laughs> and Dying Antichrist. Uh, I love the titles. They're so funny. It's so funny. Uh, Blasphemous Abomination of the Satanic Pentagram. Behold the Rising of the Scarlet Moon. Thine hour hath come, has come. I mean, tongue-in-cheek lyrics. And he went by the name Anonymous on this because he was afraid he was going to get death threats, which apparently he did. Which he, he got a lot of, yeah. Which, which is hilarious because none of these bands are going to Australia. There are a bunch of kids in Norway say, we're going to kill you. Well, yeah, come on down to Australia. Let's do it. Serve it up. But whatever. It's It added to the mystique of this record. I I love this record. This record, if, you know, if you're into the harsh black metal this is done right it's recorded perfectly the songs aren't just two riffs there's actual song structure chainsaw guitar tone awesome 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 and not, dren and are... not drenched with keyboards either no there's zero keyboards that i yep. remember and um no, I I mean, this, um, super atmospheric doom metal very much in the vein of the uk big four or big three or whatever my dying bride definitely for sure but um yeah this one i do not the follow-up it's just as good you really really should check it out because i, I heard that fact, there was like a string of them and this was the best and they kind of got weaker as they went i don't know i just kind of went on what i went after or... this they changed after this album these two albums are, are similar in style this one's cool because the the main guy the singer slash guitar player wrote a book called within the ancient forest and the this is a theme based on the book and the music is just i like this one better than this one myself um, mm, okay. Although I can tell, you, I can tell you for a fact that this one has outsold this one by a ton. Oh, both sure. Just recent, both reissued by um, Bombworks Records. So if you, anybody's interested, you can get those at boonsoverstock.com too. Right and on. I should get paid. I should get paid by. You Boons. should. You should be wearing a flashing <laughs> shirt and da -da -da -da, like confetti every time you mention their name. <laughs> okay, uh, you're up, Scott. I'll leave you. Could, be, leave could you be a drinking game. Every time I say boons, you have to drink. <laughs> well, okay, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. As long as I don't have to drink boons. <laughs> yeah, there's um, nothing wrong. I, I'll go with another kind of. A, this is another obscure one. This band, another story like X Inner, the, the the band that Alan showed earlier. They released a lot of tapes. This they were recently reissued on vinyl. This is a uh, paradox. And this is a ruler and power and the glory. They also have some other albums that came out after this. They recorded ruler first. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. I'm confused because I know there's a U.S. paradox and there's the awesome German paradox. This and is the that... U.S. paradox. Okay, because the logo is, is not the very Christian. similar. The this logo is, the is very similar. Or this is, uh, the... but this is not the Chicago one, Marty, with the ultra rare. Look at the EP. logo though. It's very similar to the German paradox yeah. logo. This, this is the first, is the... On the first German one. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Is, go ahead. This is the Texas. This is a Texas band. They were formed in, I think, '82, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then these, the guitar player in the band, uh, I can't remember his name, off the top of my head. He's pictured one of these guys in the back here. But in any case, they recorded these songs. They were again another band that was being courted by a bunch of big labels. I mean, like really big labels. Um, and they um, literally had piles of offers on the table from different labels. Including some of the Christian labels like um, Star Song and Word and those, but they were also getting other ones like not Metal Blade, but labels like that. Their guitar player got into a car accident, and he was their main songwriter oh. and died. Oh man. Um, man! And so before they could sign any of the contracts or pick one, they started getting phone calls. Oh, we're really sorry to hear about your guitar player dying. Um, we're going to pull our contracts. We're not interested anymore. Oh, mm. lame. That sucks. Um, so yeah, they lost that. So they recorded the the, the, the tapes, um, "Power and the Glory" and this one here, "Ruler," and started releasing them themselves. Now, then they started getting offers from the smaller Christian labels, 
and then they weren't interested in that because they felt they weren't getting a, a good deal because they were seeing they saw the deals that they were getting before that and so they decided we're just going to go and do everything our own so that's what they did they ended up releasing everything on their own but anyhow really good album if you're into that early Queensryche style of music that i'm talking like you know the ep and the warning kind of stuff it this is this is the direction i wish Queensryche would have went back in the day um with those high soaring vocals and those big riffs and um you know it's got hooks but it's also not pop you know that kind of thing so anyhow I have the tapes too. I have the original cassette tapes, um, but they were recently reissued. And, they, and they actually, these are the, the covers. I actually got to work on these, so I did the covers. And when the label contacted me about to do the covers, I'm like, we've got to keep the covers, the original cassette covers, because they're so ridiculous, but they're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I mean, I literally, if you look close, I don't know how you'll, if you'll see it or not, but I literally scanned the cassettes in. I spent hours and hours cleaning them up, but I kept the original dot patterns from the printing on the original cassette tapes. Nice. I wanted that. I wanted that look, you know? So anyhow, Paradox. Yeah, this is the, the band. I think they're from Austin, Texas. Um, they, uh, Obviously, there's more than one paradox out there, but that's the American band, straightforward heavy metal. Right on. Okay, Aaron. All right. Let's see. I keep I keep hoping he's going to show Philadelphia. We'll see if he does. <laughs> oh, you know something? I didn't pull that. I, I, I mean, we can change that. It's not like that. I pulled this one just for Scott. <laughs> So, <laughs> I love this record, and this is on pure metal. Okay, so one thing that we know about this band is that they're better than um, who was it who we were talking about before? <laughs> Not Light Force, the ones who weren't good enough, but they were signing crappy bands like this. oh yeah, um, Regency, uh, Tempest, Tempest. Oh, oh, Tempest. oh, oh yeah. Wow, that that was a, that was a mistaken identity, like the song, right? Um, yeah. So this record is really a piece of crap. But um, I'm kind of fascinated by it, man. It just sounds so weird. Like, there's just something about this thing where it just all sounds wrong. The singer has this weird, like, sound, which I want to describe as, like, a growl. But that invokes that, – that, that sounds like death metal type of shit. It doesn't sound anything like that. It doesn't – it just sounds like he really sucks and, like, there's no sense of rhythm or anything else like that. And on top of riffs that are kind of basic and, you know, that's about it, it kind of works for me. But, like, Scott's going to say this record sucks, and he's right. I just want to be clear about that. If you go check this out because I said I love it, let it also have been said that Scott's right in the, uh, with the opprobrium he's about to heap on this record. So. And I also <laughs> said that Aaron shows a lot of records that do suck, just so everybody knows. <laughs> it's... Um, is the song "Happy Birthday" on that record, Aaron? Yes, oh. you know that's really pretty much unlistable. I just listened to this earlier to refresh my memory. I was like, "Is that really so awesome?" <laughs> happy birthday, 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 happy birthday, 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 birthday. <laughs> it's like, what the fuck were they thinking? It like comes around the other side, you know. It's <laughs> it's not a good record. <laughs> I mean, I'm really fascinated by it. This is just so. I mean, how did I don't understand how something like this got made, like on an actual label, too? I mean, pure metal, admittedly, okay. But like, yeah, dude, if you see this for three bucks and you want to hear something you've never heard before, if it'll I do saw it. For three bucks, I'd rebuy it actually, <laughs> just because I've got fond memories of it now. Make more making fun of it than anything else, but <laughs> and that happy birthday song is hilarious. It had to be a joke. There's no way they recorded that intentionally on purpose and, and they paid they laughing. paid money to play to record that i mean yes, they, they the did. recording time <laughs> resources were used oh my gosh right. sorry yeah that that happy birthday is really bad i really kind of wish they left it up because that's almost like where they're giving up the game you know what i mean except since it's fucking happy birthday like if they even did like like that christmas project thing that those german bands did even that, I'd be like, yeah, okay, it's tongue in cheek, but the happy birthday is just so random and so like bad shit stupid that you're like, I'm not sure. I, I really don't know what they're thinking, you know? And like, how often do you listen to a record and go, I just sincerely do not understand what the fuck these people were thinking, you know? 
So if you if you like that feeling when you're listening to a record, then Torn Flesh is for you. <laughs> Aaron, I feel the same way every time somebody flips on the Hallmark Channel. My wife has been my wife has always loved the Hallmark Channel and <laughs> my mother oh my gosh, is. that is every single sh- movie for Christmas is exactly <laughs> The same. It is ridiculous. A yeah. successful <laughs> woman gets stranded yeah. by dubious circumstances and learns that she'd be much happier washing dishes for a man for the rest of her life. Tune in <laughs> for the three-hour version <laughs> and whenever the next movie starts, because they're all the same. And we'll we'll be sitting there watching, and I'll say, okay, this is going to happen next, and she's going to fall in love with her friend. And she's like, just leave. <laughs> I'm like, because I'm right. <laughs> they're all the same so- damn movie. Yep. So Torn Flesh is kind of more like Johnny Got His Gun than like any Christmas movie, I think. Except because like, Happy Birthday. <laughs> well, Happy Birthday specifically, because like because that song is like it's like it just sits there and does nothing, right? So it really kind of sucks metaphysically. But like the form that it takes as it sucks is just so fucking fascinating that you just like can't look away. Which is sort of like <laughs> the plot of Johnny Got His Gun. <laughs> Like a train wreck. <laughs> Can't look away. All right. Alan, Who's you're next? up. Hey, I'm gonna be, I'll be back in two seconds. I'm gonna explode if I don't go. Go oh, for no it. Problem. No problem. The way Aaron sells some of these records, you just always wonder, just like, oh God, do I trust him on this one or do I not? <laughs> No, he's he, like he, he, he's just, he has so much fun with them, but they sound so horrible. And there's a, there's been some records that are playing in the background. I'm listening to it, and he's like talking about how great it is. I'm listening to him like God, that record sucks. <laughs> <laughs> what is he talking about? <laughs> yeah, right. He was being ironic. All right. Well, who are you talking about now? I kind of want to know. I don't know. It's, it was a. I don't. I might have commented on one of the. Yeah, it could have been a lot of. <laughs> it's been a. It's been. A, <laughs> I mean, you show you play some killer shit too, but you really, really love. I mean, you love the shitty records, but you know they're shitty because you love them because they're shitty, and it's you know. All right, Dude. Alan, you're up. Okay, what? <laughs> Let's see. Some folks mentioned this one in the chat earlier, and it's a good example of a pattern I noticed. There was definitely a subsection of Christian metal bands that went the Queensryche direction, you know, where pretty good instrumentation, you know, vocalists obviously trying to emulate Jeff Tate a bit. And this is one that did it quite well. A band called Recon, an album behind enemy lines. I think it was the only album they made, although they there's a live album. Uh, this is a reissue that actually got the gold disc anniversary treatment, which wouldn't have thought about. But, yep, so it did. Just showed up in the used bin at a local store a while back. But it wasn't used. It was still sealed, but they just wanted like a few bucks for it. It's like, I remember that album. I'll, I'll, I'll give five bucks for that. Absolutely. It's good record. So, yeah. Very good record. It was recorded in 1990. I believe they were from, let me check. Yeah, they were a Los Angeles scene band. Uh, Some of these uh, Christian bands, Los Angeles seems to have had a pretty good scene for it. Chicago had a good scene for it. Uh, Seattle, a few bands from up there. And yeah, it's just, there's not much else to say about it. If, you know, some of the songs are a little better than others, it's uh, maybe slightly uneven, but if you were, you know, in 1990, if you were thinking, man, I wish my parents would let me buy, you know, Rage for Order and Operation Mindcrime, but they tell me I'm going to go to hell if I do. This would have been a fantastic alternative that a lot of your friends would have been like, hey, what's that? Um, can, I, can, I, can I hear that? And you can borrow my Queensryche tape during study hall. So, yeah, good album. It's always had a good reputation with Christian metal fans and has gotten a reissue. So you don't have to go digging for, you know, some 32-year-old CD. Um, you can pick it up this way instead. And I'll show a few others like that later that, yeah, very much <clears throat> camped out in that, you know, Queensryche school of kind of, you know, the more polished, a little more professional sounding uh, style of heavy metal. You can get that recon on record too. They did that as well. It's uh longer mm-hmm. ago than I think. The, actually, no, they did it longer ago than the gold version. I think they've repressed it since then too. So Boone's overstock, guys. I don't mind. I know Scott's been hyping them. I'll do it a little bit too because uh, Matt Hunt is a good dude. Total you know, support to a I, Boone. I don't know if I've never done Boone's overstock, but I know some of like that Paramecium record, Exhumed to the Earth, came out. I went over to Boone or uh, not Boone's overstock. It was the um, Bombworks. Bomb was I did it? Nope. The price was like 
I couldn't believe how much it yeah, was. It's yeah. kind of high on some of them. Yeah. It's because they do really small runs. I'm sure Scott can speak to this more, but they only do like a couple hundred of these things, if that. that yeah, they're dry. especially like that uh, Paramecium, I think it was a double LP set. So uh, I'm sure it was very pricey, especially if you only do a few of them. It yeah, drives well, you, get it, you see where the money went, you know? Yeah. It's not like that, but yeah, they're pretty pricey. Sorry about that. You're talking about Recon. No worries. Recon. I think you did the artwork for that. It was the gold disc edition. I do. Is that what you guys are talking about? Yep. Uh, yep. We were just discussing behind recon enemy lines. Behind, behind enemy, enemy lines. For that one right here. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I did the gold disc edition of that one too. Yeah. Cool. That's a great album. I love this thing. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very solid. I don't know what you guys said, but to me, it's like Queensryche meets Metallica. <laughs> That's yeah. We were just talking about yeah. It's one of the, <laughs> there was a lot of uh, you know, Christian metal bands that kind of went for that Queensryche style sound, and Recon was uh, definitely one of the better ones. Okay, now, Marty, uh, what you got next, sir? Well, so, be before you move, before you go on, Marty, let me just uh, yeah. apologize. Oh, I, yeah, had, jump in, Scott. I had to leave to go to the restroom, but when I was out there, I just found out my grandfather, my grandson, is being rushed to the hospital. What? Um, so I may have to leave at some point. Well, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, don't. No, don't worry about it. Yeah, he's well right now. It's something I could do, but his oxygen levels are just real low, and and mm. they're just going to make sure he doesn't have RSV or something crazy like that, or COVID mm -hmm. or you know that kind of thing. So right. Yeah. yeah, I just found that out when I was out there, so that's why it took me a little. Longer. Well, if you got to go, go, so don't worry yeah. about it. If you need to duck out, yeah. that's we understand. That's no problem. Yeah, I'm okay for now because, like I said, there, like, there's nothing I can do, but yeah. we'll see. Okay. Hope he's if okay. you got to go, just uh, send a chat message or just say I got to go, and you got we got, it. It, we got it covered for sure. Okay. Sorry about that. That sucks. Yeah, it does. All He's right. Be all right but, He'll be all right. He'll be all right. Yeah. You got to be all right. Um, okay. Next up for me, it's a twofer again. Um, we're going to go with the, the first one, which I kind of knew already. Lordian Guard. Um, Bill Samus from Warlords. Band after Warlord, I guess, or yes. running parallel right, with right. Warlord. Um, mm -hmm. And then also we might as well lump in Warlord with this as well. Ah! Aaron actually sent me this record. Thank you again, man. It was a killer. Deliver us. Um, didn't really know Warlord was, but I guess I suspected. Um, but Lordian Guard, I knew straight up. Um, and I, I will say that the Lordian Guard stuff, even though William was an amazing riff writer and a songwriter, the Lordian Guard stuff really kind of suffers a bit for me. I, I, I like some of it. I don't like... I think I'm assuming it's his girlfriend, her vocals, not a big fan of her singing. Um, and there's a lot of remakes of Warlord songs on here, which I don't know. Kind of wish they weren't on here, to be honest. But um good stuff, but I you know, obviously Warlord is the uh the the crown jewel of this uh what's his name? Joaquin from uh Hammerfall sings on this record. Absolutely great amazing singer and the other one i forgot to pull the other one i don't have all of their records like Dwayne. Dwayne made this freaking box of warlord records it's a it's a his his box was amazing very crafty but yeah i wanted to show off lordian guard um i'm sure people here will have more things to say about them i just recently picked these up i like them i don't love them there's a there's a lot of flaw they're very demo-ish it's kind of like sounds like done in their bedroom type of fun time to me I don't know, but Warlord, great. This is good, but check out Lordian Guard for sure. The ones I have here, I think it's a self-titled. Nope, it's not. Woe to the inhabitant, the inhabitants of the earth and um, uh, sinners in the hands of an angry god. Yeah. And of course, I really got to be in the mood for those. <laughs> yeah, this yeah. It's, it's a tough sell for me here. Other there's some cool riffs, but yeah, I love singing. Warlord though. Oh, it's a that's maybe. a fair description, Marty. You know, they're they're hit they're a little spotty, hit or miss, and it, it does sound like a home recording project before home recording became really kind of easy and <laughs> yeah. high, higher quality. It sounded good, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, they, yeah they're was, good at times, but yeah, they they really do. It have was that. before digital recording for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah it, it they can be. Yeah, they 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 are lacking uh, here and there. Yep. Glenn, Warlord is not a Christian band, but they do have a lot of Christian lyrics. All right. You are back, Scott. Oh, I thought I'd show some thrash metal records just because there's a ton of them and we're running out of time, I assume. 
Oh, we're, so we're, just, we're good. Let me just, uh, I'll just run through a bunch of them that go for uh, it. I got in here. So this is a band called Betrayal. Um, again, kind of late on the scene. They, um, they came out of a band called Martyr. That was a California crossover thrash band. Martyr released some great stuff. Um, but then their guitar player left and their roadie who became their singer and Betrayal put out two albums, two thrash albums on a little indie label called Wonderland which was the original owner of Intense Records. Um, mm. Caesar Kalinski, I think his name was. But anyhow, Betrayal, they put out two albums. Both are good. This was the second album called The Passing. I really like this record. Um, the guitar player on here, Bob McHugh, who was on the first album, he is a he's just an awesome guitar player. The, the leads on this thing, if you're a guitar player, will leave your jaw dropping. But vocals are a little more on the, um, the hardcore punk kind of sound, but still good i mean I, I really like them um one of my favorites well, this is i really like those betrayal records but i the singer is a little bit of an obstacle for me just anyone yeah, checking out but they're really interesting as far as what they're doing in the songwriting and that i was really surprised by like I, that just feels like at least um those especially that first betrayal but the second one too just feel like they're out of nowhere especially given when they came out originally they're very, they're very dark records for them being Christian metal records, but they're really good. But Sacrament, another band out of Pennsylvania. This is their first album. Uh, they had a demo before that one. This is Testimony of the Apocalypse. This is the reissue. I had the original. I should have pulled it. Um, I actually did the artwork on this reissue. I was disappointed because they printed the cover too dark, but I can't control the presses. No. Um, again, very heavy record, almost pushing the boundaries towards death metal, uh, especially in the vocals. And then this album I th thought was even heavier and faster, but they got a new vocalist, and this vocalist had more of a, um, I don't know, kind of an overkill thing going. You know, that Bobby Blitz high-pitched kind of punky, snotty kid in your face kind of thing. So I have no idea what's going, what that is on the cover there. Your guess is as good as mine. Name of the album is Haunts of Violence. So that's I got to work on that one too, so it's, nice. it's a good record. I love that you work on the album cover and you still don't know what the picture is. I have no idea what that is. I mean, there's just, I have no freaking clue. And it looks like there's a, like a, a, a devil thing going on right here. You see that kind of horns in the face. And there, maybe there's a couple of skulls. Like there's a skull right there. I don't know. I have no idea. I didn't work on it, you know. Uh, this is, I love this one. And nobody knows who this band is. But this is a band out of Texas called Consecrator. This thing rips. This is a fantastic thrash album. If you like Believer, and not, they don't sound like a clone of Believer by any stretch, but if you like Believer, you probably did Consecrator mm. as well. Good thrash. Uh, it's really good thrash. This band was another one of those ones that was, was being courted by labels, and it just never happened for them. Um, but thankfully, uh, Rocks Records put it out as part of their Underground series. Fantastic band. Really good. Do you have this one, Aaron? Yeah. Oh, um, this, is actually, this is actually the test pressing. Well, that's really cool. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah, here's the one that we've discussed: Vengeance, Human Sacrifice. This is actually the original pressing nice. on. Um, look down there. Let me put this down. Let's see if I can get it close enough so you can see it. If you look really closely, right here, Star Song Records. We were talking huh. about them earlier. Remember? Yep. So this there was. So this label got uh, Intense Records originally. They were they had one market, so they were selling to the non-Christian market, and they were using the same distribution as Medusa, which I think was Capital um, Enigma. And then to the Christian market, it was Star Song that was putting their stuff out. So you can find copies on vinyl and CD with either one of those on there. And the original album actually just says Vengeance, not Vengeance Rising, because they too had issues with another band called Vengeance that wasn't anywhere near as good. And I think I saw a bunch of people talking saying this one. I actually pulled that CD. I'm a little confused on that CD, to be honest. This is the only tourniquet I own, and um, I don't know if I like it, man. I don't know. It just the King Diamond vocals. I need to spend a little more time with it. I will say that, but if they're not as ass kicking as I thought they were going to be, I don't know. Well, take take that one away and try to listen and get this one instead, and then go back to that one. Okay. This is psychosurgery. They got heavier as they went along. They got more technical as they went along. Um, by their third album, they were super technical, and that's when they were starting to play with all the in, in all the big festivals, like the 
they, they you know they were playing with King Diamond and all and uh, Merciful Fate at that what's that was not Milwaukee Metal Fest it was on those big metal festivals and uh, Deicide got all pissed off that tournament was on the bill and threw a hissy fit with the uh, with the guy who was putting on the festival and basically said if if you let tournament play we're not playing and the the guy running the festival uh, kicked tourniquet off the bill for that. If it would have been me, I would have kicked the other band off just for being a bunch of whiny crybabies. Yeah, totally. So anyhow, oh, here's the other vengeance. This is the second album, Once Dead. I used, released, that, I used to have that on CD. This they had a total of they released a total of four albums. Vengeance Rising did so, but this was the second album. The same lineup after this. It was a. The, the vocalist was the only guy left in the band from the original lineup. They all they did a tour for this album. I, I could share lots of stories about that, but uh, it was uh, it was a bit of a disaster, a financial disaster for them. Um, mm. But they did tour the whole country for that album. Wow. Um, we talked about this band earlier, and I only pulled this one because it's really the only one I love. But this is the first Living Sacrifice. This is a thrash album. Um, yeah, this one, Aaron. No, I'd like to find a copy of that. Yeah, it was re-released <clears throat> last year. The initial pressing sold out already, and it's already selling for over a hundred dollars for the re-pressing. Yeah, you didn't vinyl. find out about that until after the fact. <clears throat> Usually, you're like my contact for this kind of shit. That was like a weird case. So, yeah, well, this is the one like, where I the, the band contacted me and asked me if I would do the artwork for him, and I said. Yeah, sure, no problem. And we talked about it, and they were like, "We want the original cover, blah blah blah." And then I come to find out, another label picked it up, and they wanted to use their artist, but I didn't find out until it was already in the process. So, anyhow, Living Sacrifice is a weird band because they they were one, and I know a lot of Living Sacrifice fans love these guys, and they they crucify me every time I say this, but they were a, they were a trend followers. Um, their first album was thrash, really good thrash, very Slayer ish, yep. Slayer meets Believer. Um, their second album was death metal because by that point death metal was king of the scene they released two albums as death metal and then um their their singer bass player left and their guitar player took over vocal duties and then they started doing the pantera groove metal thing for the next album uh. um and then after that they went for the metalcore sound and they've been doing that whole metalcore thing pretty much ever since um and i, I can't stand metalcore it's just does not, not modern metalcore anyhow yeah. the the old stuff they called metalcore back in the 80s that's you know was now called crossover i i, I dig but all right anyhow uk band seventh angel this their album covers album. are always so cool yep well this is uh rodney matthews who's one of my he's a fantastic artist one mm -hmm. the cool thing about yep the cool thing about this, this cover and this this album was where is it i got it right here here it is <laughs> I, I, I was going to have to scan the CDs to um, for the covers, which I hate doing that. But if I have to, I've got a great scanner and I can de-screen. I can do that. But I got a hold of Rodney Matthews and said, hey, I'm doing – he doesn't know me from Adam. And I got a hold of Rodney Matthews. I'm like, hey, I'm doing these two album covers. Any chance you have, you know, these that I can use? He's like, oh, yeah, I have high-res scans. I'll send them to you. I was like, oh, thank you. It was wow. so awesome. And, he's, cool. and he gave them to me for nothing, and he was really kind about it. So nothing but great things to say about – a very famous artist. This actually has the promo photo in it. So nice. Nice. And I'll show one more thrash metal <laughs> record and then I'll let somebody else go. <laughs> Cause I, but this is a um, pretty obscure one. This is their first full length album, but this is Valor fight for your life. I think Aaron has, do you have the, do you have this right? Don't you Aaron? Or at least do you have uh, the other album by Valor? He's not even there. <laughs> oh, there it oh, is. There it is. Yeah, I have that. The demos are really good too. That one that just came out that you were just talking about. Total recommendation. In fact, I think I like that one even more than this one, but this is the LP. Talk about it for a second. Aaron, go ahead and talk about it for a second. Oh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you said it's the opposite. Yeah, so <laughs> since I always celebrate this sort of thing, I love the fact that the art's done in colored pencil. <laughs> And, like, this is one of those covers, too, where the closer you look, the more you realize that it's fantastic. I mean, look at that fucking guy, right? The tree is like a broccoli tree. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> it is. I never noticed that. There's the... And this the guy's my favorite. That guy so. is riding shotgun in the IROC that the other band guy was in. They're getting out and whooping some ass. 
That's right. Yeah, so this is the, the this is one other one he's talking about, Masquerade. And again, this is another demo that was only available on tape. And I was asked to do the artwork, and I'm like, oh, we got to keep the original cover. There's nothing that is way <laughs> too cool not to use. Right. I mean, right up to uh, you, again, you can see I kept the original. I I, ha I spent a lot of time cleaning it up to make it look good, but I, I, as much as I could, kept the original printer dots on there. I just wanted that class, <laughs> that look, you know. Right. So there you go, Valor. They're probably out of all the ones I've shown, they're probably one of the least known. But all right, worth, again. Boonsoverstock.com if you're interested because most of those are available there. <laughs> right on. <laughs> you think I you think I work for them or something? Or I own the take a shot. I, <laughs> I got whiskey over here. I should take a shot every time you say Boons Overstock. Oh, I'm gonna by do the it. way, Marty, this is the one. This is the other one I was talking about. I just happened to have it behind me. So. Oh, right on. The third album, su super progressive, pushing to death metal at points. The drum work is ridiculous. Nice. Um, really, yeah, really good some, album. There's some cool stuff on that album. Yep. That's just it. I mean, I jump in on some of these, you know, I think Zoller sent me this CD, actually, and I just listened to it. I'm like, God, it just isn't very good. You know, the King Diamond vocals, and you can see what they were shooting for, but then there's some other weird stuff on it. It just, it didn't grab me. It didn't grab and me. The King Diamond vocals got, the King Diamond vocals got pared down more and more with each album. Right. So there was less of the, less of the high-pitched um, singing. Nice. All right, Aaron. Oh, what the hell, man? Let's just go ahead and tip the hat real quick. I'll just show this guy. Especially because um, it's funny. Um, but this was just coming out like back around the time when I started my channel. And it was like the first vinyl appearance of an ultimatum at the time. So it was a really big deal. And I remember I was conflicted because I didn't know if I wanted the black one or the green one. Because the green one was green, but the black ones were the ones with the lower numbers. So I ended up going for the black <laughs> one. Oh, yeah, Alan knows. Choices, yep. Yeah. <laughs> so there are a bunch of other ones now, but, um, and, you know, I, I'm i inclined to go for the original albums over the compilation, but uh, this is kind of the defining ultimatum record for me in a certain way, too. So I just had to show it off, especially because it has a picture of our other guest here on the cover. So Ripping out my own <laughs> middle heart. Yep, <laughs> that was my that was my stage garb that vest that I'm wearing there. But the, there is the yeah. first four songs on that album aren't on any other album. We recorded those songs specifically for that, and those are my favorite songs we ever did. They are great, absolutely. I have never heard Ultimatum. I was going to jam out some of the stuff before you came on. I just the day got away from me. It didn't happen. So I will do it. I've all these years yeah. I've watched you. I'm like, God, I got to check out Ultimatum. How did I never hear about them back in the day? I, I got it. When, when we when we get off um, later on, I'll text me your address. I'll send you some. I got I got something to send you as well. So we'll 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 exchange we'll exchange uh, credentials for sure. Um, Alan. Okay. Uh, I'll do a pair here. I mentioned before some more bands tended to operate in that Queensryche style. And another one I had on tape, but never got a you know hard copy replacement of once the tapes went away, was uh, Sacred Warrior, Master's Command. This was another Chicago area band. Another one going for you know the traditional heavy metal sound. Uh, another vocalist that yeah obviously was taking cues from Jeff Tate of Queensrÿche. Uh, this one came out in '89, so a year before Recon. A really good album. Yep, there's another one by him. Scott's got a few more. Yeah, so they did some other stuff. This was I think. yeah. You know, with a lot of these bands, you know, I only got to hear one or two albums. So I'd, yeah, I don't know the full discographies the way that uh, uh, you do, Scott. But yeah, this was another one that was very good. You know, a couple of songs, you know, miss, but most of the album is very, very solid. So yeah, if you like that particular style, it's good. And one other band that's a little more obscure in that style was Alliance. These guys were from New Jersey, and I think they only did this one seven-inch single, which for a long time was one of those pretty rare collectible private press deals. A bunch of copies showed up in collector's circles over the past few years. Like maybe it was right before the pandemic, maybe some, maybe like 2019, 2020 copies started popping up. Someone obviously had found a small stack of them. So it went from like, you know, a $600 single to, you know, more like a $60 single uh, over as people realize that, oh, there's actually plenty of these available. It's got the tracks Water in the Wind and what is the flip side called? 
Let's see. Da, 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 da. Born Again. Uh, you got lyrics on the back. Again, working in that Queensryche style or wanting to, these guys sound maybe just you know, a little more amateurish, not trying to be mean about it at all. Yeah, there's some uh, synths that definitely have a little bit more of the slightly cheesy 80s sound. So, you know, I get the sense, you know, these guys were trying to get to the place, you know, where, you know, band like Sacred Warrior ended up at. But, you know, these just guys had more resources or a little more time. You know, whereas these guys had to do the you know self-financed seven-inch, and they hadn't maybe fully developed the sound just yet, but still not a bad single. It's uh, again, it's a collectible one, but yeah, in terms of musical quality, maybe it's you no, know, it's not up there with you know some of the other uh, rare high-dollar ones. But yeah, just a couple more bands operating in that same particular style of uh, heavy metal. I just looked it up. There's like I found three copies immediately. All of them, two hundred fifty dollars are up. It, if the copies have dried up from a few years ago, it may be starting to trend back upwards then. But yeah, there was yep. a period there for like there was a copy showing up roughly every three months or so on eBay, and where you would copy would show up, sell. A couple months later, yep. the next one show up, sell. So you you could tell there was a pattern to it for a while until they dried up. I got mine kind of in between. I didn't have to pay six hundred for this, of course, but I didn't get it. You know when the price had completely bottomed out either. So I kind of got it at the in-between point a bit. There's two I got it with a big of... pile of stuff. Uh, so it's kind of hard to price them out at that point. Yeah, two on Discogs and one on eBay, and they're all 250 bucks. Okay. So yeah, it seems to... I don't know, again, you... it'll be interesting to see if those actually sell at this point or if people are... The market for that kind of thing sometimes does get saturated, and it takes a while for demand to creep back up there there's only so many people that are going to be interested in you know a seven inch single from you know 1986 1987 by a christian band who have some Me. cheesy 80s keyboards here and there and didn't really go any further but there's only so many people looking for that stuff <laughs> um but yeah it's it's not a bad single if you happen to cross it in the wild all right marty uh what's next for your stack all right well for me this was kind of a Oh, yeah. I forgot about this band and the CD. Um, I got this in as a promo back in the day. Um, I think this came out in 2009. Not back in the day, 2009. It's not back in the day, but <laughs> tell me when about I, the when I was off. getting promos in the mail. That was, uh, but these guys are from Malta, Forsaken. This is after the fall. Oh, yeah. I used to have that. I forgot about them. Yeah. This came out on I Hate Records, which mm -hmm. is a yep. Swedish label. Um, these guys, I mean, you look at the cover, you're thinking, oh, power metal. It's not. Uh, they're just mm -hmm. a, a traditional metal. It's a very moody record. Very yep. moody. They've got a really solid singer. He's got a very melodious, throaty, mm -hmm. kind of bluesy voice. Um, I always really liked this record. It had a really good flow to it, good songwriting. Um, and um, I knew then they were Christian, but I was like trying to find something that I did a search and I'm like, oh yeah, these guys. I forgot about these guys. Yeah, I'm gonna keep this out and spin it again because I do remember liking it quite a bit. But yeah, that's a good album. It's, it's almost got some doomy overtones yep. to it in that traditional style. I'm trying to remember if I even still have that or if I maybe traded it away. Forsaken. It's very heavy. So. It's a doomy. It's got a good production, good heavy guitars, great singer. Yeah. All the all the checks all the boxes of really good heavy metal. They're, yeah, their previous album, uh, I think it's called Animus Mundi, was also decent. I had that one on vinyl, and I know I traded that to uh, somebody at a record show because uh, right. it was yeah, it was on color. It was like a two LP colored vinyl oh, yeah. pressing, and somebody saw it and just was like, "Oh, I gotta have this." And just like, absolutely, let's work out a trade. But yeah, it's a pretty cool band. Yep. All right, Scott. Go oh, to me again. Um, I, I pulled a couple old school death metal albums that probably aren't quite as well known. This is an Australian band uh, called Metanoia, and this is in darkness or in light. Um, this is put out on um, a, an Australian slash UK label um, called Sound Mass. The reissue is it was originally put out on uh, Steve Rose label back in had to be like 1995, 96. Um, but yeah, it's just, I love this record. It's just good old school. I think what I like about this one, I like old school death metal a lot more so than a lot of the newer stuff. Sure. But yeah. what I like about this one is you can hear their, 
you can hear that they had a lot of classic heavy metal and thrash metal influences, even though it's definitely death metal and it has the guttural vocals, it has the blast beats and all the things you expect from, you know, that old school death metal sound. But yeah, this it, unfortunately it's the only one available on vinyl. That, and after this album, they got they were getting they were just trying to be different, so they started getting heavier and ex experimenting with their sound a, a bit more. But this is just straightforward old school heavy metal. Uh, I mean, death metal. Excuse me. It's cool and cover then, too. <laughs> Yeah, that and a matter of fact, I got to do the reissue on this one as well, and I'm like, no, we got to keep that hand drawn cover. It's all drawn in pencil. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, and this was one that I had no original artwork existed, so I had to do it from the CD. It came out spectacular. Cool. Um, I'm really, was really happy with it. But then, this is um, Crimson Thorn. Yep. Yep. Uh, this is their oh, first. Yeah. This was their first um, full length album. They had a, an album. Uh, I don't know, an EP demo cassette before this, they were playing their first demo was thrash metal. This was pure death metal. And then they released two more albums and they, every album, they got a little more technical and, and a little heavier. This again, is just that old school death metal style. It's been released by so many different labels. It's got like four different covers. You can find this thing in. Um, hmm. I always like this cover though, because it's, it kind of looks like some skeleton hanging on a post. Um, but it's not, if you look closer, it's just a bunch of sticks and weeds yep. uh, stuck on a post, stuck on a, mm -hmm. um, what do you call that? Barbed wire fence where the cows are walking in the background. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, and again, I got to work on this one too. So it was a lot of fun to do the, to do the reissue. Um, Cause originally it was only released on cassette and CD. But I have yeah. one of their albums. I'm trying to check right now and see which one it was. I don't even remember the Didn't title. Luke go on to be, uh, be head, uh, what yes, beheading. Uh, hang on, I got, I got the flyer right here. Um, yeah, it was this one. It was this one I had. I'd forgotten all about that. Taking the was it taking the head of Goliath? Is that what it was? Yeah, yeah, something Goliath. Yeah, head of taking the, the head yeah, of Goliath. The head of Goliath. If, if you look right here, there's actually a flyer because they just toured, and yeah. they did a Crimson Thorn slash taking the head of Goliath tour, and then they had a bunch of other bills on the. You can see all the different little logos on there. All, pretty much all of them. Pretty much all of them unreadable pile of sticks logos so yeah <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah i had that back in the day i had off i haven't thought of that in ages i bet i gave that to david because i don't know what else i would have done with it I, I will i mean both of these if you're hmm. if you're looking for stellar you know if you're an audiophile death metal audiophiles that thing exists you're probably not going to be happy because they they were low budget i mean they, yeah. they, mm -hmm. both these were you know bands that had very low budgets but sometimes i think raw nasty production works for bands like the first raven album terrible production but it works the first venom album horrible production but it works right yeah, um part of the charm first metallica record kill them all i mean that album has terrible production but it works there's a and there's a fine line between charm and then bad <laughs> yeah so it, it can fall off really quick either way <laughs> Meg, Meg, metallica kill them all worked megadeth's first album did not work i like the drum sound on the first megadeth i i think it's a lot heavier and really punchy and then, only the bass and the guitar and the vocals and everything well, else the drums good. the drum you can really hear gar ripping ripping on that record and then on peace cells they put so much reverb on the drums it's like it kind of it kind of killed it a little bit i mean that record still kills but yeah his drum product i wish i could have had the you know killing is my business drum production on peace cells that would have been really kind of cool but I mean, I, I got to show you one more thing real quick because yep. I had it sitting here. I keep waiting for, keep waiting for Aaron to show the Philadelphia record, which he hasn't shown him. But <laughs> I found this the other day. I, I couldn't believe it. It's a seven-inch promo single for Philadelphia from No Compromise. Same wow. On both sides. Huh. I, I looked. I've never seen it anywhere before. I, I went on to uh, Discogs. It's not even listed there. So I was shocked to find this thing. Um, oh, that's anyhow. awesome. Yeah, I thought it was cool. So Philadelphia released three albums. I, I, they're old school metal. They were fuck for a sec. I'll I'll, I'll, I'll pull it out. <laughs> it's uh, they were another band who were plagued with bad production, but I really like the sound and the atmosphere to it. Their first album cover. Oh my gosh, it's so bad. It's awesome. It's awesome. You know what I mean? It's yeah. You, you'll see it. <laughs> so when they did the reissue, they changed the cover. Um, which I don't know if it's good or bad. Like I said, it's so bad. It's cool. But the reissue, what they did was they took the same cover art and they made it new and colorful and nicer looking. Here he comes. 
You're search up next destroy, anyway. That's what I was talking about. Is that the one that you have search and destroy there? Yeah. So this is oh, the first one. That's tell the truth. Yeah. Yeah. And this is more like sort of hard rocky. I really like it though. I heard that about this record. And I was a little bit wary and I found this really cheap. I just kind of lucked into it after seeing a lot of copies over the years. And uh, I really like this more than I expected to. But it's not super heavy. This one is heavier. This is more like a fully committed metal album. That's the one I was talking about. The, the cover art's so bad, it's awesome. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Looks they like look they're cool. the same garbage pile that uh, Death Row was on the Riders of Doom or Satan's Gift uh, <laughs> fan photo. <laughs> So these guys are from Shreveport. Oh, actually, it's funny. Now, the label's in Jackson, Mississippi. But these guys are from Shreveport, if I'm not mistaken. Hmm. Louisiana. And actually... Yeah, I pulled this one out. Uh, I'll let Scott show this one. I'll show that one. Oh, hold on. Let me get you over there. There you go. So that's the reissue. It's the same. It's the exact same artwork. It's just... Colorized colorized and brought to life and you can actually see what's going on in it it's pretty dark but even even dark you can see this i don't know what that is some kind of demonic creature that's half dead and half alive and you see the little the little leg sticking out of his hands right there yep <laughs> it's pretty awesome but that's all in the original cover you just can't see it yeah i, I mean you could barely see it yeah i know you know those legs are there but yeah, the, here's the, the band photo on the back. It's I don't know if it's the it's, same photo on that one or not. It is. Is it? Yeah, it is the same one. Yeah. Yeah. Looks like the color's better on that one, too. It's a little more saturation on this one. Oh, they look a little pink. But um, the other one that I actually... I actually pulled this one out to listen to later when I was trying to decide whether to pull out the Philadelphia records. Yeah, this one's secular, but uh, this is some of the same guys i don't know exactly who but uh it's kind of an obscure just sort of hard rock record from shreveport louisiana so of course that appeals to me and i think <laughs> that's my favorite band shot right there <laughs> joey DeMaio's little brother yeah that's <laughs> funny i was thinking the same thing <laughs> all men play on six and a half <laughs> So this is like 79, this record, you know, and uh, yeah, and obviously not as AOR as that other band, but, uh, it's, a, but it's a cool record. It's worth a listen, you know. All right, Survivor, and Alan, you're up next. Okay, well, we'll go back to the uh, tablet here. This is one of my favorite uh, Christian metal albums from back in the day. A total Judas Priest clone, but did it very, very well around this time. Uh, this album came out in 1986. It is, let me get the picture up here. Sorry, uh, this is uh, Saint Times End. This was on Pure Metal Records. I This one I need to get a hard copy of, and I just never remember or get around to it. Yep, there it is. Dude, I can't believe you. Dot com has copies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, drink. I, Hold on. Let me drink. <laughs> Yeah, this one, I, I, I thought I had picked this up at some point. I went to the CD racks. Usually I know exactly what I've got on disc and uh, what I've only got on MP3. I went over, it looks like, didn't I pick this up? God, dog it. I guess I didn't. But uh, yeah, just dead on classic, you know, early 80s Judas Priest worship. Uh, very heavy, uh, very loud sound. Uh, some pretty cool songs like, you know, you know, there's the Christian themes. They also have, you know, some songs that have a little bit more like, you know, kind of a sci-fi fantasy, you know, leaning to it. You've got, uh, you know, two big dog head monster things and swirling vortexes of stuff. You can't go wrong with that. I guess um, if you actually look at the cover, it, unfortunately, this is not a gatefold, but it rolls around. Let's see. Am I going the right way? Yeah. To the back. And it's all one. Oh, okay, cool. Cool. And it's actually the, the, the creature described in Revelation 12. One. Is that okay? I figured it was yeah, meant to be some kind of biblical. Yeah. The three headed creature. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, I know I was, is no matter where I look at the cover, it's staring at me the whole time. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I only had ever had it on a, like a little J card. Watch out. Uh, here comes that lightning you're talking about. <laughs> 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 you know, I under snow. 
<laughs> I hope that his metal pens, by the way, we've all been trained to just automatically check to see if the cover wraps over the other side, regardless of whether there's a gatefold. I mean, ever since I got my first copy of Peace of Mind, I've done that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, and this band, you know, had done, they did an EP or mini LP before this that comes with a couple, a couple of different cover versions. Yep, there's the one that's, yeah, got the band picture on the black cover. And, <laughs> yep. So, yeah. That's the third and, album, yep. Yep, yeah, so, yeah, even that one's also pretty good. Yeah, they've done some other stuff, but, yeah, this was always, you know, for me, this was just a real banger. Um, was always very impressed, you know, how well they pulled off, you know, the Judas Priest worship without it feeling, you know, like a corny knockoff or anything. It's just like, no, that's, they know exactly what they're doing, but they're doing it so well that uh can really dig it. So, yeah, that's another one right up there with Emerald in terms of, really nailing that classic heavy metal sound. Mm. All right, Marty, that's all I've got to say about Saint. Okay. What would you like to say next? Well, this band hasn't been brought up yet. I'm a little surprised. Well, they have, they have been mentioned. Um, I haven't heard this band since what the hell is the name of the striper record with the dollar bill on it? In God we yeah. trust. I had that at the hell with the devil and, um, Soldiers, soldiers under command on tape back in the day got rid of them for some reason zoller just sent me this record fallen man i'm surprised they're this band is really kicking ass i mean it, the production's great the music's a lot heavier um the big drawback for me on this band has always been michael sweet's voice he's got a great voice but there's times it's just a little weak, a little effeminate sounding to me. And it's always it's always permeated all their stuff. I mean, I liked those early albums back in the day, but they just they didn't stick in my collection for some reason. I kind of regret getting rid of them, to be honest with you. But I was really surprised. And Zoller even said their latest album, he said it's their heaviest and one of the better records they've done. He's just amazed. He's just amazed that a band can come back after all those years and be kicking this much ass. But um yeah fallen i was kind of an eye-opening record they do after forever by black sabbath on here which is perfect perfect cover for you know a band of this ilk to do um cool i'm i was surprised my eyes were reopened to striper a little bit i was pleasantly surprised i didn't pull striper on purpose because whenever you meant you say christian metal the first thing people oh you like striper yeah and I mean, it's, it, like think. I said, I'm Mr. Obvious here tonight. <laughs> yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying, I mean, you mentioned Christian metal to anybody, and they, they pretty much think, if you don't know anything about, like, all these other bands that we're showing, they just pretty much, oh, Christian metal, that's that weak, crappy striper stuff, right? Yeah. That's the one band they all know. Yeah. It's always yeah. been his voice for me. I mean, he's got a good voice. I mean, when he's, like, in the higher registers, like, belt, he can really crush, but... Just his normal singing voice is very effeminate to me, which, you know, fine, but it's just not, I like a little more power. Yeah. One thing, Marty, the uh, the rhythm section, I don't know their names, but the yeah, the rhythm section from Striper uh, put out an album this year with Mike Flintz from Riot on guitar, and the vocalist is, and I'm going to forget his name, it's James something. He was one of the American Idol contestants who sang with Judas Priest uh, as one of his you know, showcase oh, pieces. Well, the guy that was in Quiet Riot. Yeah, he was saying for Quiet Riot for you know a hot minute there too. But um, talk about so, iconic. Um, the band's what called a uh, Clean Break. Oh, okay. it's just one word. It's on the I think it was on the Frontiers label. It came out this year. It's pretty good if you <sighs> like you know '90s era you know DeMeo era Riot or Master Plan. It's kind of in that hard rock metal vein. But uh, yeah, the striper guys, you know, sound really good in the rhythm section. Mike Flint's, of course, is always good on guitar. So James Durbin, James one. William Durbin, Durbin. Yeah, I wanted to say Turbin, but like that's the dude from Anthrax. He also so. has some solo stuff going on and put out some really cheap. The songs are super catchy, but really cheesy. I yeah. mean, like really mm -hmm. super cheesy. But he's got yeah, a great that stuff, voice. Uh, that stuff didn't go over well. So I think part of this, you know, clean break project was him trying to regroup a little bit. He's like, let me get some really solid musicians to help out this time, so it does and come across cheesy so uh yeah between mike flints and uh the guys from striper helping out the album scott you know is a pretty tight sound if if you like that particular style you know getting into a little bit more of the hard rock territory all right uh, scott, a, a way nice. to hear some striper guys without uh if michael sweet was the stumbling block for you i mean he's a great guitar player he's a great and he's a great singer i just but it doesn't bother me as much on this record it's just 
a solid, really heavy record. I was surprised. I was surprised. You're up, Scott. I, I'm going to crank through a whole a bunch again. First of all, you were talking about Saint, and I, I pulled this because I again happened to have it behind me. But this is the new Saint record from 2022. This mm. thing's fabulous. I really, really like this album. Oh, cool. Um, I can't say that I like because they've released probably 12 albums over the years. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't say that I love all of them. They did an album last year called The Calf that I thought was good, but this one is way better. I just this thing's fantastic, and I also love the cover artwork. Um, I didn't it's do the cover. Cool, yeah. I didn't do it, but I, it's it's really cool. It's called Heaven Fell. Great album. Very much in the traditional straightforward heavy. Doesn't have that pre sound, but it's still straightforward heavy metal. Mm -hmm. Really good stuff. Um, I still don't get that one, but I like the calf a lot, actually. I like that I like one. The calf a lot too until I got this one. I like it better. <laughs> so yeah, the calf is good though. Uh, another one of those Swedish bands, Modest Attraction. Um, they released three albums. These guys, uh, a few of these guys ended up forming the band called Narnia. Um, mm, yep. That was a metal on, blade band, wasn't it? No, Nuclear Blast. You're Nuclear right. Blast, yeah. They, oh, and they yeah. toured, they toured uh, Europe twice, I think, with opening up for Dio. Um, Dio really d dug them for some reason and kept taking them on tour with them. But in any case, Modest Attraction is um, a band from the early 90s but they and into the mid-90s, but they sound nothing like what you expect from them. Well, I mean, if you look at the they're wearing matching color bell bottom suits. <laughs> they're like, they almost look like they're velvet. This is actually yeah. the second the second album for, from them, and um, their sound was um, I would describe it as deep purple on your eye heat meets a Slade and the Sweet. That's mm. the kind of sound they got going on. So it's a very seventies influenced sound with the with the heavy um, organ, not keyboards, but that you know that Hammond organ sound that's kind of you know heavy and nasty like deep purple and, and your eye pad um anyhow that's that's them and then they ended up forming farming the forming the band narnia so i grabbed one of the narnia albums to show but yep. um, this was their second album long live the king um which i hate picture discs to play but it was the only way i could find it back in the day i don't so. mind picture discs as long as they give me a damn cover for them i hate just a picture disc in a clear sleeve it makes me crazy give me yeah this cover. one has this one doesn't have a cover it has an insert behind it but no cover. Well, that you know? I mean, at least it's something, you know. Yeah. Uh, let me crank through a few more real quick. Um, this is a. Uh, I love this record. This Red Sea. Mm. This is the album's called Blood. So after the breakup of Badlands, which was mm. Jakey Lee's band, mm. yep. um, Greg Chason, and the, who was the drummer Jeff Martin, who played on this the second. Because Eric Eric Singer played on the first album, but he only yeah. played on it, and then he didn't tour on it. It was Eric Martin. I think it's Eric Martin. Is that his name? I can't Eric remember. Martin. Anyhow, whoever the second drummer was who who played on the first tour and then all the rest of the records, those two guys are the rhythm section on this album, with um, with a, with the singer who is a dead ringer for Ian Gillen in his prime, mm. um, named Robin Kyle Basari. But this thing's just. It's like a heavier Badlands. Really love this album. Great production, great guitar solos, great music, big hooks. Um, super heavy. It's actually heavier than Badlands ever was. But it's. Huh. But if you like Badlands, you'll probably dig this as well. Um, but yeah, this is the only album they ever released. Because um, after this, they broke up. And some of those guys went on to form that band Circle of Silence. Um, with Larry Farkas, who was from Vengeance Rising, those, um, and then the singer was a singer from Accept that sang on that one album, the American singer. Uh, why is that oh, in my head? Yeah, him. Know, yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, yeah. the guy who sang on that one Accept album that with the American singer, he he was a singer for Circle of Silence. Um, I'm gonna show you a couple more real quick. I'm showing them quick because my wife is staring at me like something's wrong, so I probably have to go. Yeah, you probably um, need to go. Okay, but anyhow, Revelation, Spiritual Wind. This is a band from Florida, underground. This is actually the a vinyl reissue of their only album they put out, um, which is impossible to find an original copy. But this nice reissue they even came with the repress of their band, whatever you call those things, promo photo. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, just straightforward heavy metal, kind of melodic. You have this one? Yeah, the, I like that one. This, and it's on the Thrashback label, which is a mostly thrash and death metal label. So I was kind of surprised to see this come out on their label. But it's it's really, really good stuff if you're into that style of, you know, traditional heavy metal. 
This one's kind of an underground one too. Exalt Dark War. Um, this band um, released f f four or five albums. The f this one and the one that followed, I really like. They're just straightforward heavy metal. Great guitar player. Singer is good, not great. He's not like a Jeff Tater or Bruce Dickinson or Rob Halford, but he's good. Um, love mm. the artwork on it. Yeah, Under the Ruins was one of the tapes that my friends and I had back. In yeah, that day. was the second album, and that one's good too. And then they then they then they got picked up by a big label. I think it was Star Song. Um, and their sound went way more commercial and way more um, overproduced sounding. And then the next one after that, they went for the alternative rock sound. And it was just like, no, thanks. Uh -huh. um, but this was, the, it had to be early 80s. What was this? It had to be like 80, 86, 87, maybe. I don't know. I can't remember. You remember what the year was on this one, Aaron? No, not right off. Yeah, it had to be like 86, 87. Probably about 80s, original. Yeah. Under the Originally, Ruins was, was 89, on... so it had been right before that. Yeah, years. so it was probably 86 because it was a couple years in between. They ended up playing a Cornerstone Festival, huge festival out in um, Illinois, and they won the – basically won the um, – I don't know if you call I guess a battle of the bands kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So they ended up getting – that's how they ended up signing with the, the bigger label. Um, they got on Pure Metal, and then from Pure Metal, they went on to Star Song. And then this album is stinking heavy. They gone? Hmm. Back to the Sea. Can't remember what album what album number this is, but hmm. this is modern, extreme death metal. Hmm. It's freaking awesome. I can't even. I don't even know how to what to compare it to because they really don't sound like anybody to me. Um, but if you're into that real extreme, it's not core at all. It's metal, it, but it's really well done. I mean, even the cover art is just spectacular on this thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's interesting because yeah, with the band name and the cover art, it you know makes you think more Lovecraft. Lovecraft kind of theme. Yeah. All right, I'll show you a couple more real quick and then I'll go. This band is not a Christian band, but I thought I'd show them anyhow because everybody thinks they are. <laughs> <laughs> yep. This is their uh, Take You Home EP. I love Mass. I have everything they've ever released. These guys have been around since the seventies, and you want to talk about a Spinal Tap story, man? These guys are it <laughs> um, signed to a huge label for their first album. Um, and they recorded the whole album. They recorded with they're recording at the same time as Judas Priest was recording their um, uh, not defenders of the face. What's the one that came right before screaming for vengeance album. So Tom Allen, all the producer yeah. for Judas Priest, he was recording that album for priest at the same time. He was recording that Matt, the first mass album called fighter. And they were signed to a, a big label, uh, A&M Records uh, signed them. But their management was a bunch of buttheads. And A&M basically went to the band and said, get rid of your management or we're not putting the record out. So after two years of fighting litigation, the album sat on the shelf. Um, and by that time, it was 1985 and the album never got released. So they ended up signing with RCA and putting out th their new birth record. And that was the album everybody assumed they were a Christian band because it was called New Birth. But it was New yeah. Birth because they were beaten down to the ground. And yeah. hey, yeah, so anyhow, mass. But they were, they're not a Christian band, but everybody thinks they are. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right on. Triton. Uh, hmm. This is their first album. They released three so far. This was 80, 86, looks like. Um, a lot of people call them a Rush clone. But they really weren't. You have, do you have this, Aaron? Not that one. I have the second one and then that new one. But do, that do new one I really like a lot, huh? I I never thought they were a Rush clone. Did you? No, I wouldn't I say. That. I'm not Other that big than... Rush fan though, so that's kind of like a Rush clone coming out of me is more pejorative exactly. than other people. So yeah, I, I mean, they might be a Rush clone, and I still wouldn't call them that, you know, <laughs> because I the, like... the reason they get, I think they got called that was because the singer guitar player did have that kind of Getty Lee sound going on and they were a little progressive, but these, these albums were straightforward metal, really this one and the follow-up. But like Aaron said, the, uh, the new album that came out last year, blood of the Kings. Yeah. That's kind of thing is this thing's brilliant. This is one of the, one of my favorite, and this I actually made my number one album of the last year, which was what? 20, 21 yeah so 2021 um it's fantastic progressive metal of course the players on here he's got eric gillette playing keyboards and um drums 
Eric Gillette plays um what's what's Dream Theater's drummer old drummer's name? Uh, Mike uh, Portnoy. Portnoy is that? Yeah, he played. He plays. He also plays in more Mike Portnoy's side band. Um, he and just if you like progressive metal and progressive rock, try this thing. It's freaking awesome. Everything from the production to the guitar playing, even the lyrics aren't real preachy. Um, they're pretty thought provoking lyrics. CCM on side four. What's that? On, it gets a little CCM on side four. If you took the two worst songs off that record, it would be a better record. But I still think it's a great record. Isn't that true of every record, Aaron? Well, uh, if, if, there aren't two songs to take off Final Warning. But I guess that is always true, isn't it? I never thought about that. It sounded more clever before when I was thinking about it. Sorry, I just kind of thought of it. I was like, wait a minute. No. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, a yeah. Fantastic, it's a fantastic record. If you're, if you're into, like, you know, progressive rock, progressive metal at all, Dream Theater kind of stuff, I like it better than Dream Theater because Dream Theater, their songs get forgettable and boring. The, yeah. Those songs aren't forgettable and boring. What was the title of the uh, uh, Kevin's asking the title of the prog metal, the last one? Uh, that's Blood of Kings. Okay. By Triton, yeah. T R Y T A N, I think it is. Is that how they spell yes, it? T R Y T A N, yep. Um, and that was released on vinyl, CD, and cassette, I think. Likewise. And the last one I'm going to show this is another kind of obscure one from 89. This is Redeemer. I forgot about that one. I did too. It's, it's it's really good. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, this is a reissue. I don't have an original. Um, this was uh, Cult Metal Classics from 2020. Yeah. Do you have an original of that, Alan? I do not. That's a hard one to get. Weren't they? Where are they from? They're overseas, Australia, right? Mm, yep. Australia. Recorded in Sydney, so yep, Australia. Yeah, I think there's uh, either Australia or New kinda, Zealand. Kind of, I don't know. Kind of epic. Um, when I say epic, I'm thinking like Sirith Ungol kind of. Yeah, like epic. grandiose. Yeah. Yeah, kind of grandiose, like um, Manila Road, that kind of thing going on. Um, so anyhow, yeah, it's a good record. Really, I, I, I kind of dig the uh, the look too. <laughs> um, obviously, looking looking like they're a bunch of guys from the Middle Ages, but it's cool. Still, it's a cool cover, different. Yeah. yeah, you know, I feel like the singer should be holding an egg, like on that um, on that slough egg cover. Where oh, the on the back, yeah, yeah, uh, down among the dead men, he's holding the egg. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I, hang on one second. Can I? Okay. She said I could do two more. <laughs> oh. She wants me to go help her. Um, these are not metal, but since we were talking earlier about some of the early stuff, I grabbed these to pull out. This is Vision. This is their first album. They put out three albums. Um, I would pass just, that by on the rack. I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah. The album covers. The album covers horrible. It was unassuming. This is an original. This is an original pressing. It was an independent release in 19 in the early eighties. Um, but after Litter Skinner's big plane crash, um, in what was that? 1978, some of the surviving members went on to form a Christian band and this is it. Huh? Yeah. So this is got Billy Powell on, um, keyboards and Leon Wilkinson on bass. And then a well-known, um, guitar player from a bunch of Southern rock bands, Rocco uh, Marshall on guitar. And, Although it's Skinner, you tend to think, you know, Southern rock. It, it's not really Southern rock. It's sort of hard rock and, uh, I don't know, Skinner meets Kansas. It's a little yeah. more progressive than that. Do you have this one, Aaron? Yeah. I, mean, I like that record. It's, uh, it, you know, it's kind of AOR for my usual fare, but I like that record in spite of myself. Yeah. It's got some, it's got a bit of a, bit of a Kansas vibe at times, did you say? A lot more than a Southern rock vibe, actually. I don't think it's a Southern rock vibe at all. It's a it's truth. I totally hear though. Yeah, Absolutely. It's a really, it's a, it's a really good record. I, I mean, I'd never heard of it before. I, I was shocked how much I enjoyed it. I was kind of expecting it to totally suck, but it doesn't. Yeah, I kind of was good. too. I, I, and yeah, again, the cover is not great, but it, it is what it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it has been reissued. This, this is another one of those albums to find an original. Good luck. They're. Uh, mm. I think the cheapest I ever seen it for was like 400 bucks on Discogs. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I can imagine the Skinner connection alone. And yeah. Yeah. And it was independent release. Then they, yeah. right after that, they got signed by a label and they put out their, their first major label release and they totally went AOR. I mean, mm. really, really AOR. 
And then this is the last one I'm going to show, but this is um, another one of those bands from Sweden. Uh, yep. This is their third album. This is 1980. This is um, Kriegsman. And I bet Aaron just showed one. What does yours look? What does yours say on it? It's not, oh, this, Kriegsman, this, it? it's not a Swedish one. Oh, this, yes. Yeah, so this is two. The Warrior, yeah. Yeah, there's two different pressings, um, two different versions. So this is the, there you go. That's the, and I love this album, especially the first track. It's just one of my favorite songs by them, which is, what's the first track called? Constantly Changing. Yeah. On here, it's uh, Strandig Voranding. <laughs> I don't know what that, I don't know. I don't, I don't speak Swedish. So uh, Strandig Voranding. Nailed Anyhow, it. Nailed it. <laughs> they're, they're a seventies band, so you don't expect heavy. But these guys um, really have that thin Lizzy thing going on. Actually, I just played this one earlier. It's "Shooter Refresh My Memory," and I was surprised at how thin Lizzy it sounded to me. Yeah, it's got a bit of. It's got a definitely a bit of. A, I told someone that the other day online because I posted this after I listened to it online, and everybody was like, "Tell me all these different things that sound like," and I'm like, "Man, I hear thin Lizzy," and everybody else was like, "I never heard that on there." I'm like. I hear a lot of that dual guitar stuff that Lizzie was doing back in the seventies. So yeah. Anyhow. But yeah. and the singing style too, like the songwriting and the way he sort of talks through songs, but it's not just like this. Honestly, dude, I kind of like it more than a lot of thin Lizzie, which is probably blasphemous. And it says more about the fact that I don't like thin Lizzie all that much, but um, I'd probably take that. Such a shame that uh, oh. Aaron couldn't uh, be with us there for a while. <laughs> <laughs> you know, all right. The divine I'm, I'm like, intervention, yeah. let's call it. <laughs> Non-metal, but again, one of the ones that got me into metal, I talked about it earlier. This is Phil Kagey, Master Musician. <laughs> Brilliant instrumental album. Hmm. This is one of those albums you could put on when, I don't know if you guys are married or not, but put yeah. on when you're with your wife and, and you want to uh, have some intimate time alone. Great guitar playing, that kind of stuff. And then finally... I is there, is there any real short songs on it? <laughs> I'm sorry, that was a bad joke. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. This one's from '78. This is a uh, Resurrection Band, Rainbow's End, and then very much a '70s record, but yep. very much a '70s heavy record. Um, I don't know who, who to compare him to. I think Aaron has this album too. Would you compare him to somebody? You sent me that record. <laughs> oh. yeah. No, cool I too. really like that. I really like that stuff. But uh... it's, for a '70s album, it's kind of cool it's got that's that. pretty cool the die cut stuff that's really yeah. nice mine doesn't have the die cut actually but but those are rocking records those are good i mean i don't think they're incredible they're a little bluesy but they're definitely 70s heavy <laughs> you know what i was kind of like i always kind of wish they would rise to the level of that jimmy hots record ah it's funny i pulled that one too but i better go before i get destroyed you better go you better that. go, Scott. Thank you so much for hanging with us tonight, and we, we got to have you back on. So, think of a I topic. It. I really have. enjoyed it. We had a great time. Me. We will. I have a few more things to show. We'll do that. We'll carry on without you, but good luck with your grandson. Hope everything's good. I'm going to show Thank the you. Jimmy Hops record in your honor. I'm going to grab it. <laughs> right on. I appreciate it. It's an awesome. Hope everyone's okay, man. Everybody, go All check right. out Scott Waters' uh, sites. He's got a lot going on. Definitely go check him out. Yep. Cheers, Scott. Thanks, Talk man. to you later, Cheers. man. See ya. Take care, Scott. Thanks. All right, y'all got to see this cover, okay? All right, let's check this out. Yeah. So, what do you guys think? Uh, Kenny Rogers' beard should it go? Should it go away soon? <laughs> no comment from from Santa Allen. <laughs> uh, Santa Allen has no uh, yes has no horse in this race. <laughs> <laughs> I should be wearing the hat. I look like Santa. In Kenny Rogers. Yeah, that was great. It was great to have Scott on. That was awesome. We'll have to yep. get him back again sometime. Lots of cool stuff. I'm going to have to follow up on a couple of those. I want to hear that Red Sea. And I think I've heard that Dagon before. I, w I wouldn't have remembered it, but when he showed us, like, I'm pretty sure I checked that the out. The fact that's Christian is a, a, a brain scrambler, because like you said, you're thinking Lovecraft. You know, Cthulhu. Yeah. Yeah, well, Tom mentioned in the chat that it may have, the word may have originally... or. Uh, may have originated from like a Middle Eastern god, so there may be like a biblical connection to the word Dagon, and Lovecraft kind of, you know, lifted that and retooled it a bit. So, yeah, maybe it's got more of a Christian uh, leaning than we realized. But, all right, uh, you got it, Aaron? What you got? It's all your turn anyway, Aaron. <laughs> all right, so so in honor of Scott having to take off, since he just uh, 
since this just got referenced, and this is one of many great records that he put me on to, and not the usual shit. This is that Jimmy cover Hunt. is fucking awesome. <laughs> Beyond the Crystal Sea. And Beyond wow. the Crystal Sea is what this fucking record is because it's a Jesus record, right? But it's like this weird, like, prog shit <laughs> with a concept record. And, like, and, and by the way, just in case you're thinking, boy, the artist really, like, the way he rendered that guy is really, no, dude, that's just what he looks like. <laughs> That's awesome. The artist fucking nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> he did nail it. Yeah, let me see if there's anything funny in the gatefold. No, it's just the lyrics. Yeah, do, there you go. We, Vision Records. Do we dare ask what the concept is? <laughs> I don't I honestly I don't even fucking remember what it is. But the titles are like Observations of a Larger Reality, which of which part one part A is March of the Dead Souls, and part B is Hand of the Most High. Danzig yeah. meets the girl from Stranger Things on the cover. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Okay, pretty much. I got to stop smiling because like, my lip is hurt. I bit the shit out of my lip earlier in the week. When it was oh. watching me. Every time I smile, it kind of yanks on it. And like, yeah. it makes it hard to talk about a record. <laughs> it's fucking just inherently entertaining as this one. I mean, this one just fucking. It's like the never ending story on acid, if that's possible. <laughs> That's that's a scary thought, Rick. Uh, a scary yeah. thought. Honestly, dude, uh, Scott Scott told me about this thing. He was like, "Yeah, I just have that one on CD. I've been able to find it on record." And I took one look at a picture of the cover, and I was like, "Oh, I'm finding that guy on record." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Come to Papa. <laughs> <laughs> that's Jimmy Hots with a Z. Okay. H O T Z, and I don't know who the fuck this guy is. Scott could probably tell you some stories, but. As far as I'm concerned, there's nothing that he could do that I could add to the perfection of this. I don't even I mean, really care what that record sounds like. I just want to look at the cover. I mean, I can you can kind of tell what the record looks like just by looking at it, but it can't be good. Is it good? Oh, I love it. I really do. It's, I mean, that tell me, is it good? <laughs> I don't care if you love it or not. Is it good? Uh, I haven't played it in a long time. It's it's good. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. It's not great, but it's good. <laughs> Jimmy, I'm not hot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, Alan, you're up. Dude. All right. How, how many more are we, are we wanting to do here? I've got two or three. I can go through them quick, or we can do a round or two. I can do... I mean, I can wrap it up in two or three. I mean, it's all good. I just have a couple obvious ones here. I'm kind of done, too, so I can yeah. keep it going, though. Yeah. Uh, well, let's, we'll do... Yeah, okay. I'll go. I've got two. I'll show maybe an honorable mention. Okay. And this was a tape that, uh, yeah, my buddy David and I loved back, you know, around high school. Uh, Christian band called Rage of Angels. Self titled album. I think this one was on Regency. Let me check. Uh, yeah, this was a Regency from 89. The band, they were going for kind of the harder end of the glam spectrum. So, He's somewhere maybe between like early Motley Crue, not quite up to Wasp standards, uh, something in that neck of the woods. Uh, it's hit or miss. Some of the songs are good. Some of the songs are a little meh, uh, but it's got one absolute pounder on it called Are You Ready for Thunder? And any heavy metal band from the late 80s could have recorded that song and it would be considered an anthem. But it was recorded by you know, this really obscure Christian metal band, and so it never got much notice. But it is a killer track. Um, you know, it's the highlight of the album, no doubt about it. The rest of the album, like I said, it, it's up and down. Not great, but not uh, not terrible throughout. But that one song alone is worth the price of admission. This was a funny one because uh, you know he and I used to hit a lot of flea markets and stuff, uh, especially in the summer. And one time, he hadn't gone for reason so i was poking around one of the, our regular flea markets by myself and i found a bunch of you know random metal tapes and bought them all up and what it turned out to be i didn't know at the time until i bought them and started picking through them at home a lot of them they were all bands that had they were either christian metal bands this was one of them or they were regular metal bands that had something kind of christiany about the name or the title and so you could tell it was you know they were just like somebody had like bought these tapes thinking maybe this is a christian band too 
Uh, like folks were joking earlier in the chat. I think Ryan was made the joke about uh, metal church, uh, you know, not being Christian metal. Uh, for example, one of them in the pile was a Sodom record. And uh, you, but it's in with all these, you know, Saint and Rage of Angels and White Cross tapes. So you're like, someone saw that Sodom ties, like, oh, that's a biblical reference too. And they had bought that and <laughs> then they quickly got rid of it. But uh, yeah, the Rage of Angels is pretty good if you like that style. And they had one little footnote in history that drummer, I think it was, uh, a year or two later after the band fell apart, would join up with the band Steelheart who had the big radio hit Angel Eyes around 1980, uh, around 1990. I don't think he played on the album, but he may have toured with them or something. So they had that, you know, there's that one little footnote where the one guy from this one hit wonder, you know, glammy hard rock band, Steelheart has a connection back to Rage of Angels. Oh man, Tom just found, I glanced at the Jimmy Hotz website and he claims he worked with Sid and Marty Croft on a project, Hotz and Croft working together. Dear Lord Jesus. <laughs> uh, that, uh, did, were fire-breathing Dimitrodons chasing him, Tom? Please tell me there's a fire-breathing Dimitrodon drawn in the art style of the <laughs> album cover, chasing him through like the land of the lost. Oh, that'd be great. That, that would be a thing. Eating yeah. slea stack as he goes. Yeah. Uh, no, dude, 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 dude. No slea stacks. <laughs> Those things haunted my fucking nightmares mm. for like ever as a child those things were creepy they were right? creepy i will agree pylons and the crystals and yeah mm. okay um you, you you talk marty i, I gotta go uh, find my happy place <laughs> for a minute <clears throat> i already showed these guys but i'll show them again because this is a great band feast eternal they're from traverse city mm -hmm. michigan um melodic brutal death metal this is uh, their debut album, Prisons of Flesh. This is a reissue of the Prisons of Flesh with some bonus tracks. The second album with Fire. And their third and, I guess, final EP, Forward Through Blood. I mean, for Traverse City, it was great. And for the world, they were a great band. Um, this amazing death metal, and I'm privileged to work with TJ and the Glorious Dead. You know, we write together, and he's a great guy knows what's up with death metal super awesome band uh this band i pulled because they were on the list and i'm like oh yeah i can't believe i never got rid of this but um this is embrace the eternal by embodiment kind of death metally kind of modern it's on the solid state label a uh, subdivision of uh, tooth and nail it was death metal that didn't jump into the mall metal style so i kept it again it's been i should have thrown it on before this so i could uh be a little more eloquent about the description but i remember it being kind of technical um heavy good little modern not something i've ever listened to since really um crucified this is their debut album this is a crossover styled album yep i remember that band they have a second album. I have never heard it. Some people in the chat have said it's good. Um, but this is a, a, a surprisingly decent record. I recently got this last year or so. And, yeah, it's solid crossover. Not going to lie. You know, there's there's a, a style for everyone. Um, I've got... The next three, I'll just wait. My last one will be the next... I'll, I'll, I'll finish out in the next round. Uh, Aaron... All right. Well, I have two more here. I guess I'll just hit them both real quick because they're both kind of minor ones, relatively speaking. I mean, I kind of feel bad that I keep holding up these shitty records and talking about how great they are. But fuck it. This one's cheap. <laughs> is it good? Well, it's what is, what is it Chariz Charisma? Yeah, it's Charisma. Charisma. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Because it's like metal, except it's actually like... Uh -huh. Well, what it is, it's like some brothers in Sweden who like made a Jesus metal record. They're all named Nikolaus son. And it's like literally all of them. You see that? Yeah. And these guys had some money behind him or something. Like I think there's some story where like the family like you, you know, it was something like that. Cause they like made a 45 with a picture sleeve too. And this record had good enough distribution that uh, you know, it's never been particularly hard to find, you know. 
and it's not really that great, but it's just kind of fun. And um, for being sort of a weird, a little Swedish one, I mean, you know, that's kind of cool. And then this is another one that's on that same label as, uh, as uh, that Steel Legacy one that I showed before, the uh, Final Axe one. And this one isn't really as good as that one, but it's more ambitious. This band is called Cross. And it's a really, this is really kind of a rough sounding demo on this one. And there are like a couple live tracks on side too that, you know, the tape even like cuts out in places a little bit and shit. It's just kind of hard to like really take in. But there's, they're, they're really shooting for the stars on this record. Like this is like an intent. And as far as what they were going for, they were going for like something really epic and something that's like prog, but not like prog metal, just like something that's sort of a big that way and grandiose and the writing and that kind of shit. And it sort of gets away with them because there's like definitely some intro shit that's too long. And, you know, some parts that are a little bit drawn out, but overall, man, this is just kind of a fun record to listen to. If you like hearing what that band in, playing down the street in the garage is up to, you know? Yeah. So yeah, and they're just called Cross. So, well, well, Tom did a deep dive on the Hot Sky, and uh, he created MIDI software that John Anderson of Yes calls no question the greatest musical instrument since the invention of the piano. Wow! There you go. The guy is not only has great hair; you just want to run your fingers through. He's uh, very talented as well, skilled uh, musician. Yeah, seems, seems to have some fans out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, Alan, you're up. All right. Uh, yeah, I've got just a, a couple more I'll hit here relatively quick. Um, a newer Christian band that the name's been popping up. I guess they're making a few waves here and there. Not really metal. I guess they're more metal adjacent, but uh, Witch Hazel. Uh, they're done a few albums, a British band. They're more, uh, they're described as having like, you know, hard rock, folk elements, 70s elements. They remind me very slightly of. Um, asbury if uh, folks know that band uh, let's see and i wanted to show this one because uh metal mayhem sent me this uh, a while back so he's usually in the chat he's been there tonight so yep steve if you're still out there thanks again for this uh, i'm not real familiar with the band's output but i've heard a little bit of their more recent album which was called i think three pentecost and yeah it's quite good uh but this is a earlier single that they'd put out <laughs> I put uh, Witch Hazel on my bunions. <laughs> yeah, it's probably going to beat me too. If I was going to say Witch Hazel, even if you spell it with a Y, is dangerously close to hemorrhoids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's so soothing. Let me tell you, when you have that flare up, that Witch Hazel really takes the edge off. Anyway, God. go ahead. I I Jesus, no. I'm not going to rub the uh, the record on my butt because uh, <laughs> no. it, it's, it's too good. I have some records I would, but uh, not that one. Um, I do want to mention some folks, you know, uh, some folks have been asking for bands like, you know, Trouble and, you know, White Cross. I've got Trouble next. <laughs> okay. I, I didn't pull White Cross. It seemed like behind Striper, White Cross is probably they can fight for, you know, second place on the everybody knows that band name. But yeah, they were very popular in their day and did some good albums. Uh, I did want to mention uh, this band, Deliverance. Some folks have talked about them. I used to have a couple of their albums and just I don't have them on hard copies anymore. This is album number two called Weapons of Our Warfare. Very good thrash metal band. Um, they, would, they were not going to be top tier. They weren't going to knock Metallica or Megadeth off the throne or Vi for the Big Four. But, you know, still a very good band. And they had you know some fun songs all the way too. they had a little bit of a sense of humor in some of their tracks like they have one song uh, my buddy david loved to death called chipped beef and it's just it's like this real heavy thrash you know kind of riff mosh pit vibe and it's just the vocalist just stands there and like reads a recipe for two minutes it's like add one half cup of water two eggs <laughs> so they could kind of you know, have some fun and goof off you know as well um and then the very last one I want to mention is a uh, power metal band, San Diego's Cage. I um, thought I had that CD I was looking for, and I must have got rid of it back in the day, but that's a good CD. It's pretty good, yeah. This is their third album, I believe, uh, Darker Than Black. If it looks funny on screen, it's got one of these slip cases that's a three-dimensional thing, so you're supposed to be able to see the angel warrior fighting the devil here in three dimensions. It actually looks surprisingly good. It actually works better than most I of these kind of things. Three D shit. Yeah, yeah, it, kinda, it, yeah. It actually does have some movement. Uh, yeah, and it is actually showing up on camera. I'm kind of amazed. Yeah, but, um, blow it. Yeah, Cage. Uh, you know, at least early on, did 
definitely play with you know, some, you know, Christian lyrics. They did, you know, the good versus evil, but always very strong on the, you know, good shall conquer evil kind of thing. They got away from that on later albums. The later albums are still very good. I like them, but they kind of eventually, I think they kind of burned themselves out on this theme because the fourth album after this one, Hell Destroyer, is like a 75, 76 minute album. It pushes right up to the limit of one CD and it's a concept album of good versus evil. The problem with it is they'd already done it on this album and wrapped it all into like one really good track. It's uh, the first one, kill the, you know, track number two, kill the devil. It's epic, tells the whole story in like, you know, five and a half minutes, you know, brotherhood of priests, one of, you know, you know, Satan's, you know, priests betrays him and joins the coalition and they take him down. Bada boom, bada bing, it's done. It's a killer song. The Hell Destroy album takes that same exact story and stretches it into 79 minutes worth of songs. Oh, too much. Too much. Which, yeah, it, it's... That's it's like one that minute away from not being able to fit on a CD. They really <laughs> did push it right up to the limit. It's not... The songs are not bad in any way. It's just... It feels too long for the concept because they'd already done that. They'd been there, done that. You didn't need to take that one song and stretch it into a full concept album. So yeah, after that point, they kind of, I think, uh, got tired of slash downplayed, you know, the the more overt Christian themes on some of the stuff. And, you know, they did lots of other cool songs instead. But uh, yeah, Cage is one that wanted to show off for more of the power metal side of uh, Christian metal. And I, the band may not ever have identified as, oh, we're a Christian metal band, but it was always pretty obvious. You know, with a lot of their lyrical themes early on that uh, they were coming from that point, which is fine. They did a great job with it there. If anyone's not familiar with cage uh, painkiller, Judas priest, uh, by the time you get to like albums three, four, five, they, th these guys loved painkiller and they do painkiller and they do it quite well. That's what you're looking at. The first two albums may be not quite in the painkiller vibe, but, uh, yeah, after that, you can get those albums and feel like you're listening to the uh, just an, another very good take on uh, Painkiller, but sometimes with a lot of Christian lyrics. Sometimes with a lot of comic book and warfare and creepy monster lyrics. So they're all over the place. All right, Marty, I will stop there for the night and let you wrap us up. All right. Yeah, Michael, uh, Scott, before he had to bail, um, he showed a couple Narnia things for sure. Mm-hmm. All right, I'm going to round this out with uh, Christian adjacent bands. I was afraid I wasn't going to have enough content. And again, all these are kind of obvious. The first obvious one is Trouble. This is a self title, but it's mostly known by Psalm 9. Got the skull. And actually, my, my favorite of the three, because it's the first one I heard by them, Run to the Light. Um,. These guys were dubbed by their label as white metal, which in hindsight, the band didn't like, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, they're all potheads with faith. We'll, we'll just kind of put it with there. they they had faith and they, they, they smoked some pot. Um, but you know, the whole Christian vibe on here that was getting passed around, it was accepted. I don't know if it's just because on the label they're on. Cause it, it, I remember correctly back in the day, the Christian bands kind of got some heat. Here's another. Here's another. Um, what's that? They got ghettoized, and they did it to themselves to a large degree too yep. by distributing through the. I mean, that's why we didn't hear of a lot of these bands at all. So yep. it's kind of what we, yeah, yeah kind of what we talked about earlier. Some of some of them just wanted to preach to the choir and, and not really step outside that box. So yeah, they kind of let themselves get cornered sometimes. Okay, here's another one. The, um, I mean, from the cover art, Candlemas Nightfall. You got the song on here, Samaritan. Mm -hmm. Very much yep. that that classic tale. Guy helps out a, a beggar, a homeless, and his uh, three angels come to the foot of his bed and reward him in heaven, basically. It's an amazing song. It's an amazing song. This is an amazing album. And where the Christian bands were getting lambasted for being Christian, you got guys like this that are toying with it heavily. They're playing with the themes they got the Gregorian style, you know, feel. There's like, this is a very religious feeling album. It just the vocalist is. is Messiah. Yeah, Messiah Marcolin. <laughs> and, you know, he's got that grandiose, huge, sounds like he's singing in a cathedral style, you know. Oh, I thought you were talking about the fro. 
Oh, the fro too. The fro, he, he could see that from heaven for sure. Um, <laughs> they, they don't make halos in that size. They do not. But um, yeah, this is a band that got a pass. They just did. And you want to know the kings of the, the getting a pass? Black Sabbath. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about Black Sabbath. The, this In the press and the religious groups were calling these guys Satan worshipers and stuff. Yeah, they smoke pot. They did drugs. But you also have songs like After Forever. Yeah. Uh, you ever thought about your soul? Can it be saved? Or perhaps you think that when you're dead, you just stay in your grave? If God's just a thought within your head, or is it part of you? Is Christ just a name that you read in a book when you were yeah. in school? I mean, the whole damn song is very except, Christian. Except for the line, you know, you know, with Pope on the end of a rope, on which the is the, the line rope. everybody focused on and freaked out and thought they were all Satanists over it. Nothing else in that song fits that theme whatsoever. But yeah, they took that one line and ran in the opposite direction with it. Yep. And uh, that Striper album I showed earlier, they covered the song. Mm -hmm. And they yeah, didn't change right. any of the lyrics. You're right. And well, I mean, ton, tons of those early Sabbath songs, they're all actually about not screwing around with the devil or evil stuff. No. It, it's run the other way and run fast. Yeah. The, the God is good type of stuff. Uh, Geezer yeah. wrote a lot of these lyrics and it came from a very Christian mindset. You know, be, be afraid of the darkness, be afraid of the devil, mm -hmm. come to the light. That's where the good things are. And then of course you have songs on the same album about sweet leaf and, uh, you know, there's a lot of political topics in here too, but sure. at their core, they were a very Christian-y feeling band. But yeah, I just want to pull some Christian adjacent um, adjacent bands out as well that didn't get plastered like a lot of these other Christian bands did. What, what, what gave them the pass? Because they also sang about drugs. I don't know. I don't know. But yeah, does anybody think have, have anything else before we uh, knock it on the head? I think we've covered it quite well. It's been a good topic. Uh, I was really glad Scott could join us for it. Uh, all kinds of cool stuff he showed off there. Really glad Aaron could join us too, because of course I knew he was going to bring a bunch of cool stuff too. Always does. Always does. You Absolutely. guys, if you're not familiar with the um, Aaron the Metal or the Metal Theologians YouTube channel, the links in the description. Please go check it out. This guy has got a massive collection that he's been collecting his entire life and anywhere from reggae to sun Ra to metal, some blues, some jazz, it's all in there. Maybe not so much blues, more jazz, but, um, yep. And yeah. And to folks in the chat, thanks for participating. Sorry. We didn't get to some bands folks mentioned. There's lots of others. Of course we could go on and on. Uh, didn't get to around to showing Zish. Didn't get to talk about theocracy. Uh, the, the list always just goes on and on. But I think we didn't show any blood good. I used, folks were asking for yeah. People blood are good asking for blood good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't think I've ever. I've had good. songs yeah, I, by them, but I've never had any of their albums, so I really couldn't talk about them very much. I think it's great. We didn't show any of the obvious striper ones either. Marty showed that later one, which is worth showing because it's. Mm -hmm. Such a surprise to hear what they sound like now. They kind of kick ass now. They're, they're kind of bringing the balls. There are some balls in this shit. It's heavy. It's aggressive. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Scott made a reference to the LA version of Ransom. That was a good band. If you like more of the hard rock side of things again, uh, I was going to, one of their albums was, could have come up, but just didn't. So yeah, lo lots of other good stuff out there and lots of good stuff mentioned in the chat. Sorry if we missed one of your favorites, but maybe we can bring Scott back and do it again sometime. Well, we're definitely going to get Scott back. Absolutely. And uh, this time we're going to let him pick the topic. I, I kind of like, dude, let's do an episode on Christian metal. And he was down with it. So, Oh, yeah. I mean, it was kind of the perfect topic for him. Absolutely. I knew I knew it was like you giving him a layup, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's a total layup. We could keep going with all those stories. Yeah. And I knew he would bring some behind-the-scenes shit, too, cool. which, you know. Um, but Always anyway. To hear. Yep. Yep, check out the Metal Theologian. Check out Let's Talk Metal. Links in the description for both those guys. Check out No Life Till Metal. And also check out the Metal Roundtable. Uh, a lot of things to check out this time, folks. Uh, a lot of good stuff going on. And we have a couple t-shirts for sale. If you're interested, pick it out. If you ordered a shirt the last week or so, sorry, I've been busy. It's not getting there by Christmas. I know Christmas is fucking ruined. But um, I'll get it done hopefully next week. I just got a big job cleared up so I can actually get to work on mail order again so thank you again everybody for supporting the t-shirt designs thanks you team Marty. there is no santa this year i know i know i know 
And also, thank you for the super chats tonight, everybody. We so appreciate all of you. And the That's chat was just blown up. We really, really love it. Thank you so much. That's it. Anybody have anything to add? Got uh, one shopping week left till the big Fuck day. So, me. Uh, yeah, if you, if you if you ain't too ready, hey, we uh, we got we got this. Uh, this tree is loaded. I don't think you can see it behind me, but uh, nice. Yeah, that tree is stocked, and uh, the the little guy has been uh, crawling around it, circling, he is, he is <laughs> circling like a shark. Just yeah, I know what it is. I know what it is. Yeah, yeah. He, he's at that age where he can start fear. It's like based on the dimensions and the weight, I'm guessing. And then he gets it completely wrong. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, great, everybody. Have a great one. We'll see you later. Have a good night. We'll see you. Oh, wait. Wednesday, the Heavy Metallurgy Album Club is covering uh, Dark Thrones Arctic Fortress. So get ready to hear me bitch about this record for an hour. <laughs> little little, uh, little insight. But uh, anyway, cheers, everybody. We'll see you.